the order, and uh, we're going to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and it will be led by Alan Pierce, who is a 45-year member of uh, the KCPD, and will be retiring in November. Welcome. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please remain standing. We'll be led in prayer by Chaplain LaGuardia. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and plan and to seek your wisdom for our city. Father, we thank you for your word that says, if we dwell in you, we are under the hand of the Almighty. So I ask you, Father, to place your blessing upon this day, all who serve, all the families, all the children, Father. We ask you in our Savior's name, amen. Man. Uh, our city council presentation will be made by Councilwoman Shell. Yes. Good morning, uh, President Tolbert and commissioners. I am Raina Park Shaw, Councilwoman for Kansas City's 5th District. Thank you so much for uh, having me here today. Uh, just a brief update that I have in regards to, uh, and, and actually if I, if I can just for a moment, um, because I am the wife of a former police officer, if I could just ask that we observe a moment of silence for the fallen officer. Uh, Blaze, who, as we all know, was just recently, um, or who was recently passed due to his um, work in the the community. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I think it's obviously um, he paid the ultimate sacrifice, and I believe that it's important that we acknowledge that. <laughs> Uh, just a brief update in regards to um, what's happening at City Council. Uh, we recently passed an ordinance, uh, 210756, to uh, remove guns from the street. Uh, this is, was a process that, we, that was in place, I think, for, for years for domestic uh, violence, um, um, for those individuals who have been convicted of domestic, domestic violence giving them an opportunity to surrender their guns, but unfortunately we didn't have a place for them to even put the guns. And so we passed an ordinance that um, will allow us an opportunity or a place for them if they wanna surrender the guns to turn those guns in. And I think they uh, had about 179 of those individuals who wanted to turn in their guns. And so we wanna make sure that we do our part to allow them the opportunity to do that. Um, other than that, I think probably what, what I have to say today is probably more questions than answers. Um, you know, ultimately serving in um, a district south of the river where a majority of, the, or 97, 98% of the homicides that occur in our city are occurring south of the river. And of course, my district is, is unfortunately represented in that. We just had a 14 year old that was just killed this week. Um, my, my focus today is really to Talk, talk about prevention. I know in your meeting last month, there was a lot of discussion about prevention. And so I ultimately would like to use this as an opportunity to open the dialogue, to begin the dialogue to, so that we across the street can talk collaboratively with you all about how we can work to prevent the violent crimes that we have in our city. As the mother of two African-American young men, I have a son that'd be 25 this Sunday, uh, and my other is 20. And I, I've already stated, my husband used to be a police officer. I feel like I'm positioned so that I can see both sides of that. And I know that 
there are things that are working in the city. Uh, for example, uh, the school resource officers. I know that they are uh, doing an excellent job, and I want to take this opportunity to speak specifically about Officer Rogers at Ruskin High School, um, who is doing a great job, as I'm sure all of the other school resource officers are, really making a connection to those young men uh, at an, an, an impressionable age and making an impact on them. And I'll say he specifically spoke with my son when he was 18, and it did make a difference. So I want to commend the school resource officers in that program, but I want to talk about what other things can we do t to bring about the prevention efforts. I'm not sure if you all are aware of the blueprint for violence prevention. It was uh, unanimously passed. And can you tell me if you are or not? Have you all, are you familiar, familiar with that? With okay. it? Yes. And you, okay. So um, I didn't want to make any assumptions. But with the uh, blueprint, which I also serve as a co-chair for the Health Commission, um, which you know this was born out of that. It was a three-year study that and plan that was established based upon about 60 different organizations in the community. So the city now is working to implement those. We're trying to allocate dollars to work on the many efforts of that collaborative um, process. But my question for you all is what else can we be doing? How, how else can we uh, work together to bring about the prevention efforts to really reduce our, our violent crimes? Can I say something? Yes, please. One of the things you can do is help us fund our police officers. We have, you mentioned the ones in the schools. I think we now have only two because we don't have enough money to pay for those people. We also need new officers to be able to respond to 911. You were talking about your district and calls. Well, we don't have enough officers to go to all those places. Um, and last week, last month, I'm sorry, we heard about uh, the efforts of the city to use the um, American Recovery Act, which is federal funds that, that is appropriate for that. Please help let us use that money that doesn't come out of your budget and would be able to be used for those officers. But I mean, and we also, the PAL Center, I think you know, is wonderful at working with young people, but we don't have enough money to put people in there very often. I mean, very often, they're there all the time, but not enough. So that would be a tremendous help. And we believe that the activities of educating the youth, either in the school or the PAL Center, wherever we can contact them, we think will prevent crime. And we think that the numbers are showing that. But helping with the guns is a big help, too. So if you could keep those off the streets, that would be great. And I appreciate that. Um, I think given the, the fact that um, the pending the lawsuit is not final, I will reserve additional comments yeah. in regards to that. Right. Uh, but I, I'm here to say we need to work collaboratively to, to, and I think our citizens need that, they deserve that. And, you know, I'm hoping that we can move beyond whatever happens, whatever the result is of the lawsuit, because our, and not only them, our, our, our officers need us to work collaboratively as well. So I'm extending an invitation. If there's anything That's that great. I can do, then please feel free to reach out to me. Well, Thanks. it, it would have been nice if we could have collaborated before those ordinances were passed. And, you know, the, the challenge is, who puts those meetings together, who requests those. If city council requested it, we would be more than happy to have some joint meetings. Uh, what was the ordinance that you said uh, would remove guns from the street? Sure, it's 210756. 210756. And in that ordinance is there, you know, years ago we used to have a buy, buy gun program or buyback program. Was there any money in there for people to turn their guns in or just an ordinance to, you know, allow them to turn them in? So I think this was a part of their plea. It becomes a part of their plea deal. And so then once they agree to that, then they turn their gun in. There's no gotcha. funds okay. established there. there. We had funds established to set up the, the infrastructure, but that's it, though. 
Okay, and then I guess finally I would just say, you know, you all are a direct line to Jefferson City. And I'd also like for us to maybe look at how can we leverage that direct relationship with the city to get more guns off the street. I, I know I've heard many of our officers uh, and our chief even talk about the fact that we need to get guns off the street. So if there's any opportunities there for us to be able to partner or, or leverage that, those relationships, I think that would be amenable as well. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have a um, joint committee of the Civic Council and Kansas City Chamber of Commerce uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Chief Smith, men and women in uniform. Uh, pleased to be here today. My name is Mark Hill, President of the Civic Council of Greater Kansas City. I'm joined here by my colleague, Joe Reardon, the President and CEO of the Greater KC Chamber. And we're here today to share uh, some of our findings from a joint study on police governance and public safety. I also want to acknowledge we have several of our volunteer leadership who have been part of this joint study with us over the past year. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the community members who are here who are interested in this issue. Could, could you have them stand and let us see you there? Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. So after months of joint study and research, the Greater Kansas City Chamber and the Civic Council, we released our first findings and recommendations on police governance and public safety back in late July. The mission of this joint study was to research how the Kansas City Police Department's governance, policies, and procedures can build community trust while also advancing safety, equity, and justice. And we made every effort to hear all perspectives and opinions on the topic. In fact, over the course of the last year, we held 37 joint study meetings including 14 listening sessions, and you can see some of the names on this slide of the folks we talked about. I will say that many of our members, as you know, were involved and supportive of the body cam project, but this issue of how do you increase public safety while building community trust is a new issue for our organization. So we've spent a lot of time over the past year listening and learning. Our first recommendation is actually something that was mentioned earlier in the meeting. And that is, we believe the city and the Board of Police Commissioners should engage in dialogue rather than litigation to find common ground regarding the department's current budget and other contentious issues. We recognize that the board and the department has the mission of keeping our community safe every day. We recognize that our men and women in uniform have the expertise to carry out that mission. And we also recognize that the funding comes from the city and that the City Council has an accountability and a responsibility to taxpayers and voters to ensure that those funds are well spent. Neither of those critical roles are likely to change anytime soon. And so what we need to have is a partnership, a long-term partnership between these two bodies to move this community forward. And on behalf of the business community, Joe and I, we in the Chamber and the Civic Council, we pledge to do our part to help encourage that, facilitate that, or play whatever helpful role we can play. The second recommendation is really not the purview of this board. It is really the appointment authority. And it's simply that as vacancies on the Board of Police Commissioners occur, we encourage the appointment of new members who reflect the racial, ethnic, and geographic diversity of the community that KCPD serves. We actually sent a joint letter to the governor uh, on this topic asking him to keep those uh, factors in mind as new vacancies occur. And here to take us through the third recommendation is my colleague, Joe Reardon. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members of the board. It's good to be with all of you um, this morning. Um, our third recommendation is that the investigation of police department personnel should be independent of the Kansas City Police Department for all cases of excessive use of force and all complaints brought by the public. I think it, first and foremost, it's important um, for us to say that we know 
the vast majority of officers that serve are professional and care for the community they serve and the, and the residents that they serve. Um, as in many professions, um, there are those that don't live up um, to that level. And there are serious incidents that occur. In those cases, the OCC serves a critical function for the public and the department itself. We believe the process can be improved, and we've learned in our listening sessions that there's a lack of trust in the current process. Our hope would be that this recommendation can help build community trust and improve the OCC process. There are several action steps that we have under this recommendation that we're gonna go over in general terms today. First, that the restructuring of the process um, be one that employs industry best practices, fully independent of the KCPD, and then report directly back to you as the Board of Police Commissioners. Um, the reform structure, we believe, should employ dedicated professional and legally empowered investigators from outside KCPD. And again, our belief is that this can help strengthen the OCC process. A few other of those action recommendations, allowing fully independent investigation of complaints against police officers for these cases, cases of use in force, and those brought forward by the public. We believe that that's a critical part of this and that it can assist in um, the um, transparency and building of trust. I would note that the department in our recommendation would retain the ability to appeal any investigation and or recommendation after the investigation is complete and reported back to you, uh, the Board of Police Commissioners. Finally, on this one, we know uh, that identifying funding mechanisms will be essential if you were to decide to move down this path, which we hope you would consider, uh, to provide the resources for an independent investigative staff. We want to let you know that the Kansas City business community stands ready to assist you in identifying and allocating funds. And again, we reiterate that this function of OCC is a critical component of the law enforcement effort, and we believe it needs to be funded at a, an adequate level to support this work. The final component in this third recommendation we think is a critical one, and that's the reestablishment of a community advisory council and a re-engagement of them in the process to provide guidance on the community complaint process and to act as a communications bridge between the community and KCPD. We know that the Community Advisory Council had been robust in the past. We think that that should be brought back. Um, we've also looked at other cities in our research. We know other cities um, have, are using a similar kind of advisory council, and we've found that that's been a successful and, and important component um, in the work that they're doing there. Uh, we would note that the Advisory Council would be providing oversight and transparency into the investigative process, but would not be directly involved, of course, in the disciplinary process of a particular office or issue. This would also allow community members to be involved directly uh, into providing greater transparency and accountability of policing practices um, in, their, in the city, and the Community Advisory Council could also serve as a communications vehicle between the department, the OCC, and the Board of Police Commissioners and the residents who file um, those complaints. We think this is an essential component of such reform to allow that Community Advisory Council to be reenacted. Finally, we believe this recommendation and its components are within the purview of the Board of Police Commissioners, and we as the business community, both the Civic Council and the Chamber, we stand ready to work with you on them uh, to advance the cause of um, public safety in our community. And I'll turn things back over to Mark for some final comments. Thanks, Joe. So next steps. Our challenges around public safety are certainly a business and economic development issue and we remain committed to be involved and a partner in this effort. Our group continues to meet. We'll be considering additional recommendations. We know that an area of focus for the board and the department is increasing the diversity of our police force <laughs> to match the representation in our community. And in business, sometimes we bring in outside expertise to help us think through opportunities to, to move that issue forward. And if the board or the department felt that that was appropriate to do, we would certainly support that kind of effort. We're also uh, continuing to have community conversations. And we would like to plan to ask for an opportunity to come back before this board in the months ahead to share any additional recommendations or findings that we might have. As Joe said, we remain uh, committed to be a partner in this effort. And at this point, Joe and I would stand for any questions that the board may have. Uh, let me ask, uh, on your community advisory council, uh, when you did your research, how many people normally 
uh, are on those community advisory boards <clears throat> and uh, how are they chosen? So I think that varies um, in the research that we've done, um, Mr. President, but um, I would say our recommendation isn't for a specific number. I think we would anchor ourselves back to a diversity um, on that advisory council that reflects the geographic and the, um, all the diversity of Kansas City, we think would be an essential component to that. Um, and having an adequate number that would reflect that, we believe would be the, the, would be the goal to achieve, regardless of what that specific number might be. Okay. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I appreciate your help on getting the body-worn cameras. We really wanted that, and we appreciated the help of not only your group, but many people in the community. But just thank you very much for that. So I had a suggestion on that um, as far as that committee. I think it would be a really good idea for them to do a ride-along and for them to do some of the little tactical things that they do when, when these officers' lives are in fear, to go through some of that training, to feel that adrenaline, to feel, you know, they have to make these quick decisions so they get a better understanding for what they're up against as well. And it, it just, you know, provides a well-informed person, you know, as far as being on that board. We, we, we would completely agree with that. We think those that would be selected to serve on such a community advisory committee would be ones that would, be, would have the privilege, quite frankly, of understanding in depth the operation of the police department and the work that you all do, um, because we would be putting on their shoulders rep the representation of the community at large. So I think understanding you know, the day-to-day -day challenges that exist for individual officers, as well as the department, would be a critical component of that. We'd be very supportive of it. Thank you. Chief, any uh, questions or comments for? All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we do look forward to uh, some follow-up conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have a 2020 resident survey, Office of the City Manager. Um, my name is Kate Bender. I'm with uh, the city manager's office with Data KC, which is a uh, division of the city manager's office. And I'm here to talk to you about the uh, fiscal year 2021 resident survey results. And I apologize, this was actually on your agenda for last month. So I'm coming a little bit later than usual in the, the cycle, but unfortunately I had a COVID issue at my house as, as is the, where, where we're at right now. So, but glad to be here today. Um, so, the, uh, just to give you a sense of who, briefly who Data KC is, we are uh, a division of the city manager's office that has been around for about 12 years now, and our focus is on supporting data-driven decision-making in the city through a variety of different functions, and we've certainly worked with a lot of um, your staff in those efforts, because I know that data is very important to what KCBD does in their operations as well. Um, as part of that, we are responsible for the resident survey administration, analysis, and reporting. And so uh, the purpose of the resident survey, it is, I think, one of the most key data sources for the city because it tells us uh, our residents' perceptions about everything ranging from, you know, individual city services to really a sense of outcomes, so how they feel about um, living in Kansas City and, the, you know, their, their experience living here. So th those broad... Uh, views of kind of satisfaction and perception are a big takeaway from the survey. Um, it also helps us understand um, we can analyze within groups and understand how uh, things like race and income and geography impact um, people's experiences and people's uh, use of city services. And so that really helps us understand that, you know, we're not a monolith as a city. We have a huge variety in residents. And, um, understanding where they're all coming from and, and what those differences are. And then finally, there's a prioritization element uh, with the, the survey that allows us to understand from a resident perspective, what would they like us to prioritize for improvement? 
So again, broad, broad uh, details here about the survey. It is a random sample survey, so it functions very much like a poll. Um, so we can survey a sample of residents and feel, uh, infer those results to the population. So very different in that way from kind of most surveys that are sort of out there for anyone to take. You have to be in our sample to take this. Um, we, uh, and we actually have a pretty large sample. Actually, for a city of our size, 1,000 would probably be a sufficient number to make that sort of inference, but we're at about 4,000 every year. Um, the, um, and then we also uh, can have a fairly consistent sample across council districts, which is important mostly because that makes, uh, makes sure that we are representing our entire community, since our council districts are roughly equal in size. Um, the survey is actually administered just so you have a sense of when this information came in. We actually administer it quarterly to kind of help understand trends, um, but also just to kind of you know make sure there's no seasonal variation at play. Um, so this survey took place during um, the city's fiscal year uh, from um, b between basically May 2020 and uh, April 2021, the last quarter came in May 2021. Um, and so fully pandemic year, right? This is our first survey that took place fully during the pandemic. So certainly we saw that impact in some of the results. Just a, a brief glance of those demographics, which as I said, are representative of our, uh, of our resident population in terms of race, gender, um, and age group. We also have a diversity of um, incomes um, represented. So you can see when I, if I reference differences across income, this is sort of how the survey sample breaks out. And then you can see council district there too in the uh, even dispersion there. Hey, can, so can you go back to that slide? Yes. So down on the right hand side, uh, council district one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's saying the percentage of those 4,000 surveys that came from each district. Correct. All yes, right. that's Just correct. To understand yes, that. thank you. Yeah, right. feel free to jump in with any questions as I as I discussed. Um, so uh, just a couple of sense, uh, just so you have a sense of the broad survey, and then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, questions that pertain to public safety and police services. But big picture, we did see a decline in quality of life ratings this year. Um, in my mind, that is very uh, attributable to the pandemic. Quality of life was a challenge in the last year for, uh, you know, from a lot of different perspectives. So still relatively high ratings here, but uh, as I said, a little bit of a drop. Um, we also, again, looking at those kind of cross uh, those, those ratings across different demographic groups. Um, we do see that ratings of KCMO as a place to live are lower for residents at the lowest income group, residents in the third and fifth district, um, and residents who are black, other American, Indian, Alaska Native, or two or more races. Um, kind of opposed to the, the city service, or to the quality of life ratings, actually ratings of city services um, came up a little bit this year, which was, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, and those we see are relatively similar across the city geographically. We did add a question this year about satisfaction uh, with leadership during the COVID-19 pandemic and saw that over half our residents were satisfied with, with leadership and uh, just over 20% dissatisfied. And I should say that pie chart here does show the, the scale for most of our questions, which is very satisfied to very dissatisfied and neutral in the middle. And so you'll see on some of the upcoming charts, when we talk about satisfied, that's a com combination of the top two, dissatisfied combination of the bottom two. So a couple of uh, questions that are at the beginning of the survey that with those quality of life uh, questions, so I focus on them here because of obviously the relevance, but these are not in the police services section, these are kind of overall quality of life. So feelings of safety in the city, um, satisfaction unchanged from last year, dissatisfaction unchanged. Um, we've seen you know, a fair amount of uh, decrease in satisfaction over the last you know, five to 10 years and increase in dissatisfaction. And we are uh, lower than the national average, which the national average numbers I cite are coming from our contractor who is a national contractor for resident surveys. You can see a little bit of geographic difference as well um, at, for these charts. When you see orange, that means kind of lower than average ratings. Blue means higher than average ratings. And this is a zip code based map. 
Um, so that it was safety in the city. We also ask about how safe you feel in your neighborhood. And here we see quite a bit, we, we see quite a bit higher satisfaction overall, but also quite a bit more dispersion. Um, so obviously people coming from individual neighborhoods um, having much more distinct feelings about their experiences in their neighborhood. And so here you see uh, areas of the city that are blue uh, compared to the middle kind of neutral and then uh, orange, which is dissatisfied. So quite a bit of difference across um, uh, uh, in this, this question. We also see uh, pretty uh, notable differences across demographic groups in terms of feelings of safety in the in neighborhood. So uh, across race, you can see 60% satisfied for white residents, um, on down to you know black African American, 53%, um, two or more races, 39, American Indian Eskimo, 36%. Obviously some of the smaller race, uh, Racial groups, a much smaller sample size, less representation in our population, but did want to show them all here in the chart. There's also a really direct, um, unfortunately, a direct correlation between income and um, satisfaction with feelings of safety. So um, you see the lowest income group here, uh, more than you know, double the dissatisfaction with feelings of safety compared to the highest income group. And just to underscore from one other perspective, kind of the importance of feelings of safety in your neighborhood, which I don't think anybody here would, would question really, but um, from a statistical standpoint, um, there, it is really highly correlated with a lot of these other outcomes. So we see a really high correlation with those ratings of Kansas City as a place to live, image of city, quality of life, um, so those service questions. It also is actually interrelated, it's also cor correlated uh, to other service areas. So it, it is correlated with uh, people's ratings of police services, neighborhood services, even parks and recreation, as well as um, actually their perceptions of maintenance and physical appearance of their neighborhood. So it's a really, I consider it, looking at this, I was, it really stands out to me that this is a very key metric that is, is worth thinking about and spending time on. So moving into the sort of city service perspective, um, we ask residents about their satisfaction levels with broad service areas. Um, and so these are the ratings across service areas. Then we also ask them what are their top three priorities for the city to uh, focus on improving in the next two years. And we combine that to, to get to that importance number. So um, you can see we have the rank from last year as and this year, the top three um, ratings here, or top three priorities, uh, which is a combination of satisfaction and importance, very consistent over time. Infrastructure, police services, neighborhood services, and you can see so on down. So um, police services, uh, higher satisfaction than overall than some of the, the higher priority, other higher priority services but also very high importance, just, you know, uh, just below infrastructure. Um, when we look at that question, overall quality of police services, 55% um, satisfied, did see a decline in satisfaction this year and an increase in dissatisfaction. So further into the survey, we actually then had the opportunity to ask residents for, about their satisfaction with within service areas. So, you know, we have a section on infrastructure, section on police services, and so on. So this is a view of the satisfaction levels for the um, seven questions that are in the police services section. And then the same type of importance ranking here. So just a couple of uh, highlights. Um, you can see the, the, again, very consistent over time, maybe the entire time we've been doing the survey, overall efforts to prevent crime, number one, uh, priority for residents um, in, in terms of improvement. Um, from there you see, and, and then I, I guess I'll point to the other end of the scale um, at the, at the, toward the bottom, traffic enforcement, parking enforcement tend to be uh, compared to other service areas at the lower end of priorities for residents. So that's been very consistent over time. We did add um, a couple of new questions this year that um, kind of switched up some of the order. So responsiveness to the police department to resident concerns and relationship between my neighborhood and the police. So those are their kind of uh, middle, uh, along with effectiveness of local police protection and how quickly police respond to emergencies. So when we do this IS rank, uh, we often do it as well across geographies to see if there are differences in geographic prioritization and, uh, and then racial as well, racial and ethnic 
uh, demographic groups if there are differences in priorities. And so we did sort of, we did see that here to some extent. On one hand, efforts to prevent crime are the number one priority across all uh, districts and all racial and ethnic groups, which I think is a really strong takeaway from this, that that is a really clear top priority. From there, you get some dispersion in the results. So you see the overall number uh, two is effectiveness of local police protection. But when we hone in on the third and fifth uh, council districts and, uh, and then separately hone in on uh, black and other race residents, relationship between my neighborhood and the police is the second highest priority. So just a, I think a note that, that again, these results are representative of our community and that um, are, there are lots of different perspectives within our community. Um, so efforts to prevent crime, that number one priority, um, satisfaction was unchanged this year, but dissatisfaction did go up. Um, and we are a little bit below the national average there for satisfaction. And you can see uh, satisfaction is pretty low across the board here, but you do see um, some areas central, center of the city and a, a little bit south where you have lower levels of satisfaction. Effectiveness of police protection. Um, Satisfaction uh, was unchanged and dissatisfaction increased a little bit, uh, also lower than the national average. And you can see uh, a good amount of uh, kind of geographic um, difference here, uh, north and south tending to be, or far north, or northland and then uh, far south tending to be um, more, more satisfied. For the two new questions, we obviously don't have trends, um, but just to give you a snapshot of how those um, showed up in the in the perceptions and then the maps as well. Um, so these questions, you know, have some similarity, both about relationship between um, police department and the community. I would say on the whole, uh, the responsiveness question, we saw overall um, lower satisfaction, higher dissatisfaction, and less geographic difference across that question. Uh, relationship between my neighborhood and the police, um, overall higher satisfaction, um, and lower dissatisfaction, but much, uh, quite a bit of geographic difference there. The three other police service questions all uh, saw the satisfaction unchanged this year. And you can see the relationship with the national average, um, how quickly police respond to emergencies is, is lower, and then uh, enforcement of local traffic laws is similar to the national average. We also ask on the survey um, about residents' experiences with different city services, infrastructure, to try to get a sense of how many, what proportion of our population is um, is experiencing um, different, you know, having different experiences. Um, and uh, so, for questions that relate to public safety, have you had contact with a KCPD officer in the last year? Um, fairly consistent um, from last year, pretty consistent overall. We added a question last year, have you or anyone in your household called 911 while in KCMO in the night last year? Uh, also unchanged from prior year. Or actually, I think that might have been a slight drop in uh, percentage. Um, and then were you a victim of a crime, you or anyone in your household? And that was consistent. We did add a question, uh, or really just for this, the year that just completed, um, did, are you aware of the Greater Kansas City tip, uh, Crime Stoppers Tips Hotline? Um, and a really high percentage there, 82% of residents said they were. So that was um, an interesting insight that, uh, you know, I'm sure that there's a lot that goes on there in thinking about those operations, but interesting insight that there seems to be a very high awareness in our community. So uh, that brings me to the end of the presentation. I do want to point you to other resources that you have available. Uh, this presentation will be posted to our uh, kcmo.gov slash survey site. You can also uh, access the full report that has all the questions and is written up by our contractor. Um, and then we also have a link to our resident survey dashboard, which allows kind of anyone individually to go in and look at things like trends, geographic differences, and you know demographic cross tabs. So, Great resource for being able to dig in more. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, are all the surveys by email or are some of them snail mailed as well? So, uh, great question. The survey is actually triggered by mail. The sample is pulled on an address basis and every resident who's in the sample receives a mailed copy. Um, in order to boost the response rate, because um, I think we get about half 
roughly half of our survey through uh, mailed responses. You can also, when you get it, you can go online. And then we also do follow-ups to, e or the contractor does follow-ups to emails and phone numbers that are tied to those addresses to, you know, increase the response rate. Uh, very extensive uh, report, and uh, glad you gave us the link where we could go follow up. I'm always interested in statistics and surveys to see, you know. And so the, these are done uh, once or twice a year, or so we. Orderly. Yeah, so we, uh, we did. We have already started our uh, administration of the FY 21-22 survey. Actually, quarter one is out. Uh, on the streets right now so okay. um, we will we uh, do some internal reporting um, on Q1 and Q2 usually and and would be happy to if there's ever interest either with staff or the board to come back and give you interim results as well um, because we do usually present to the mayor and city council on quarter one and quarter two um, and then yeah we do our big roll-up of the results at the end of the fiscal year in the summer and early fall awesome thank you thank you very much all right Body worn camera audit, uh, city auditor's office. Good morning, Board President Tolbert, members of the Board of Police Commissioners, Doug Jones, city auditor. I'm here to present a scope statement for our body worn cameras audit. My presentation will outline our reasons for doing the audit the audit objectives, the work we'll perform, and the anticipated release date. Body-worn cameras are small devices that record audio and video and are capable of being worn on a person. Law enforcement agencies use these cameras to record officer interactions with the public. Between November 2020 and April 2021, the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department deployed over 800 body-worn cameras to officers in the six patrol divisions, plus the traffic enforcement and special operations divisions. Body-worn cameras can be used to promote transparency, increase accountability, and discourage inappropriate behavior by officers and the public. Many Kansas Cityans have asked the mayor and city council to, for patrol officers in the Kansas City Police Department to be outfitted with body cameras. The city council directed the city auditor to conduct an audit of the body-worn camera program. Our audit objectives are to determine whether police officers are using body-worn cameras in accordance with department policies and what recommended practices would enhance the police department's body-worn camera policy. To address the audit objectives, we plan to interview Kansas City, Missouri Police Department staff and go on ride-alongs, compare police department body-worn camera policy and internal directives to recommended practices, review body-worn camera data to assess whether access, supervisory review, and record retention comply with department policies, internal directives, and record retention regulations, Watch randomly selected body-worn camera videos to assess whether officers are using the cameras in accordance with department policies, and compare body-worn camera data and dispatch data to determine whether all dispatch calls are recorded. We plan to release the audit in April 2022. Missouri Sunshine Law limits the videos that we can review for this audit. Per state statute, mobile video recordings that are part of an active police investigation are closed records until the investigations become inactive. The statute also outlines other reasons some videos or parts of videos are closed or authorized to be closed records. This impairs our ability to assess officers' use of body-worn cameras in some situations and will limit conclusions we can draw about whether officers are using the cameras in accordance with department policies. This concludes my presentation. What questions do you have for me today? Yes, Dave. Uh, one of the things you say is you're going to compare the department's body-worn camera policy and internal directives to recommended practices. Recommended by whom? Those are what we're looking uh, at. We'll have to look at that. Some of those might be coming from DOJ, might be practices that are in place by other police departments. So that's part of what we do is identify criteria that are applicable. There might be some things put out by the uh, Police Chiefs Association that include some recommended practices. We can talk with the department to see what some of the practices are that they've had or some suggestions that they have. So it's, we always search for good, applicable, relevant criteria. 
All right, and so the report will be released in April of 22. That is our plan, to be back in April of 2022 with that. Do you have any questions? Questions from the board? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So we have crime reporting. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'll begin with presenting data on homicides. And you're under what tab? It's going to be under D. Uh, first, I'll begin with the blue sheet that you have passed out in front of you. If you refer to that document, you will see that as of midnight, we had 111 homicides in 2021, although we're currently working at a parent homicide that occurred this morning, so the actual number is going to be 112. This is compared to 147 in 2020 during the same time period. That's a 24% decrease. Additionally, the five-year average of homicides year-to-date is 113. So we're currently down slightly less than 1% compared to the five-year average. We have cleared 64 homicides in the current year. This number includes homicides that occurred in 2021 and homicides that occurred in previous years. If you'll refer to the second handout that you have, titled Non-Fatal Shooting Comparison Report. You will note that on, uh, excuse me, from January 1 to September 27th, 2021, we had 387 non-fatal shooting victims. In 2020, we had 485 non-fatal shooting victims during the same time period. This is a 20% decrease compared to last year. In August of 2021, we had 46 non-fatal shooting victims compared to 54 in August of the previous year. That is a 15% de decrease for the month. And as I mentioned last year, or excuse me, last month, July was the only month so far this year that we had an actual increase in the number of non-fatal shootings compared to 2020. Do we have any idea what causes them to go up or go down? Uh, month to month? Uh, or year to year for that matter. It's, it's cyclical. I mean, we can compare, um, you know, August of this year to August of last year and see what was going on, but it, it, it kind of depends. It varies. It's hard to make a generalization. Okay. We've obviously had significant decrease, and I'm trying to figure out what is it that is causing the decrease? I mean, I'm hoping it's shoot review and all those other things, but... Right. I, I would, I would like to think that it's... Go ahead. Yeah. If, if you were going to explain that later, I'll be quiet. <laughs> um, I, mean, I agree. I, I think the collaboration that we're, we're working with our uh, federal partners, with the city, with uh, some social services providers has got to make a difference. Uh, as you mentioned, we have shoot review um, every week where we go in depth on each shooting and homicide that occurred in the previous week and, and have action steps to follow up on them for the following week. And actually, shortly here, we'll discuss uh, risk for re retaliation uh, messaging. And that's one of a, a key component in cutting down on retaliatory violence. And we'll discuss that here in a second. Thank you. Uh, now, if I may direct your attention to tab D. Around the third page, you'll find the August 2021 non-fatal shooting report. And you'll see that of the 46 non-fatal shooting victims in August, 33 were cooperative. So this means that 13 victims, or 28%, were initially uncooperative with the police and did not wish to pursue charges. This is an improvement over the previous month where 36% were initially uncooperative. Black males accounted for the highest number of non-fatal shooting victims with 29 which is 58% of the total number of victims. Black females came in second with nine victims, which is 20%, and white males third with seven, which is 15% of the total number of non-fatal shooting victims. The 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 age groups were tied for the highest number of non-fatal shooting victims with 14 each. And then the 35 to 44 age group was next with 12. 
Last month, nine suspects are known or have been identified at the time of this report. Eight of the suspects are black males and one is a black female. Now, if you'll move ahead a few pages, um, you'll see the recovered firearms report. You'll see that we recovered 229 firearms in August of 2021 compared to 204 in August of 2020. The five-year average for firearms recovered in the month is 218. And we've recovered 1,612 firearms between January 1st and August 31st this year. Uh, if there's no questions regarding firearms-related offenses, Captain Justin Cobalt and Sergeant Janita Harris will provide a brief report on risk for retaliation messaging. And uh, as we mentioned, this is one of the primary tools that we use to reduce retaliatory violence. Good morning. Uh, I'm Captain Justin Cobalt, Commander of the Law Enforcement Resource Center, and I'm joined by Sergeant Janita Harris, the supervisor of the Gang Intelligence Squad. Um, I wanted to do a brief introduction and refer you guys back to the July Board of Police Commissioners meeting. I did a report uh, covering the Public Safety Partnership, uh, a couple other initiatives, one of those being the risk for retaliation, and we were asked to return uh, to this meeting to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the risk for retaliation. I did want to touch on a couple things that had already been uh, talked about today to kind of, um, I guess, give us the environment that we're working in with these risk for retaliations. Uh, one of the things that, that popped up on my phone and the news uh, over the last couple days was some more information that came out about the increase in violent crime last year. Nationwide, the FBI uh, final UCR numbers came out that uh, homicides were up 30 percent across the country. Here in Kansas City, they were up 18 and a half percent. And then so far this year across the country, homicides are up another 12 percent above the 30 percent increase of last year. Uh, here in Kansas City, obviously what's been discussed, we're down almost 25% this year compared to last year. So I think um, that, again, we've all talked about, we, we, we can postulate and think about what we might uh, put some of that, uh, what we can um, say is responsible for this decrease, uh, right? And I think the, the work of the gang intelligence squad is definitely one of those. Uh, they are the main driver in the, the shoot review and preparing the, the documents, the PowerPoints, setting up the meeting, uh, gathering intelligence of the homicides and non-fatal shootings to share. Uh, one of those responsibilities is the risk for retaliation, which is a piece of that, uh, and also gathering intelligence on groups uh, that are committing violence in our community. Uh, but today we're here to talk about the risk for retaliation and how that plays into this process, and I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant Janita Harris to give us a little bit deeper information on this. Morning. Morning. I'm Sergeant Harris, and I am the supervisor over gang intelligence, one of three supervisors in the Law Enforcement Resource Center under Justin Cobalt, my captain's command. So this morning, we're going to be talking about risk for retaliations. And I guess I just click it. There it goes. Okay. So, risk for retaliation. What is a risk for retaliation notification? It is a message that we typically will give to the family and friends of a victim following a violent act that has occurred. During that messaging, we're going to key in on three major points. That is, we're going to ask them not to retaliate or take matters into their own hands. We typically ask them to cooperate with the investigation. And third but not least, we try to offer them resources and services to get through a very difficult time that has occurred in their life. Um, this messaging actually began out of Casey Nova, which is the Kansas City No Violence Alliance. I think many of us are very much aware of that program and the focused deterrence model that came out of that. Um, this messaging was born out of that and it continues today. We've actually expanded on that and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. So my squad, Gang Intelligence, and other members of LERC are responsible for identifying incidents where retaliation could possibly occur. So we do like a threat assessment. Um, part of that is in the shoot review process. So each incident that occurs, every non-fatal shooting and every homicide that occurs, we take a look at that and we utilize reports, criminal history, human intelligence, and leads, investigative leads, to determine whether or not there's going to be a potential of retaliatory violence. That's going to be categorized into one of three categories 
high, medium, and low. Typically, if it's high or medium, we're going to ask the detectives and or officers who are trained to go out and conduct messaging. So here's the RFR process. A risk for retaliation notification is conducted when the police department obtains credible information that a friend or family member of a victim makes threats to retaliate against a party they believe to have been involved in violence against the victim. That's not the only time that we do it. We also will go out if we know that there is a feud occurring. Uh, we could be asked to go out from other investigative elements such as domestic violence if they have something going on, even though it may not be a part of the shoot review process, it's not only um, it's not only just for that particular process. We can do it at other times as well. But that's mainly one of the times that we're going to go out. Uh, at the time that we go out, we are going to attempt to contact subjects of family members, subjects or family members that are making that threat. We're going to advise them that we know that the threats are occurring, and we're going to ask them or tell them that they need to stop. Please don't take matters into your own hands. It's typically going to make the situation worse. There are many times where we also find that we need to explain the investigative process. You know, um, many of us that are in law enforcement, we've been out on those scenes, and they can be relatively difficult to deal with people because they're hurting, right? It's natural when someone has been shot or killed for the family or the friends to be emotionally in a different place. Mm -hmm. So they're not always going to hear what's being said to them at the scene. So there are times when we go out to calm that family down and to be able to have an actual discussion with them, we have to explain the process. Uh, we will also encourage them, of course, as I said before, to cooperate with the investigation. And if we receive any information during that conversation, we're going to try to relay that at all times to the actual case detective. So I want to point out that we don't work the cases. We work in connection or in tandem with those case detectives to ensure that we are reducing retaliatory violence here in Kansas City. Um, one of the incidents that just recently occurred um, when we talk about uh, credible information, a couple of, about a week and a half ago actually, one of my detectives received information that um, there was going to be retaliation based off of a juvenile that was shot. Now, while it occurred in another city, the information was coming from members of our city that wanted to go and do something. So we actually had to go out in the middle of the night and talk to both the person that gave us the information, talk to the victim, and then we had to go to the other side of that feud and talk to them. And in both cases, we also tried to offer, offer services to both sides of that feud. Um, and in many cases, it actually does go well. Uh, we see a lot of times that they're very accepting of services, right? So a lot of times we're going to get grief counseling to them. They may, may need to be relocated. Um, oftentimes when it comes to homicides here more recently, we're asked to help them with funeral costs, um, which goes down to we determine social services, right? We determine if it is needed. And if it is needed, we're going to typically reach out to the social service worker at the division station and or we will also reach out to the KC Nova client advocates. They do a great job. That program is run by Darren Faulkner. Um, and they recently helped us out with another one here um, this past week, actually. Um, we advise the individuals that we're speaking to of the resources that are available to them. And we allow them to voice their needs and their concerns. Um, it's a dialogue, right? And we're going to get into that here in just a second. But once we have completed that notification, we do document it, and we inform our partners, whoever they may be. If it's um, the social worker, sometimes it's probation and parole, who's also been trained in it. We'll notify them as well. Um, and then we just track whether or not it was successful or unsuccessful. So we started tracking. I think we're trying to do a better job in terms of tracking uh, what we have done, whether they're successful, if they're still in progress, or if they're not successful, that kind of gives us a beat on what we need to improve on, right? So let's talk about the training. Um, our squad has expanded the program and the, the, trained all the division analysts. So they're a part of LERC, right? They help us to identify any time where a uh, threat is and perhaps even <coughs> recommend who needs to go out, who is best suitable to deliver that message. We have trained 157 officers, detectives, and sergeants to assist with the program. We've also trained members of probation and parole, the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office, the KC Nova Client Advocates, and recently we just went over and trained our neighbors, uh, the Kansas City, Kansas um, Police Department, members of that department. Um, in our training, we do emphasize that it's a conversation. 
It's not a situation where we're going in and we are doing an interview. We're not conducting an interrogation. That's the case detective's job. Our job really is to get to the kitchen table. When you can go from the front door and that porch and sit on someone's couch, or they invite you to come and sit at the kitchen table, then you know you can actually have a dialogue with that person as to what's going on and what they really need. And it's a two-way street. So we have a message that we want to deliver to them, but we also want that feedback from them to know whether or not we're hitting the nail on the head. What is it that you need? And a lot of times when we can give them something that they need, they're going to not just be hearers of that message, but doers of the message, and so will we. So it's actual conversation that is actually occurring. It's a coordinated response from law enforcement, um, our resources, social services, and all of it is to stop retaliatory violence here in Kansas City, and hopefully abroad, right? Because it doesn't just stay in Kansas City. Crime doesn't stay just here, and we've noticed that as well. So uh, with that expanded program, uh, more messaging has been completed than it had ever been before. So we have more people that are trained to do it, more people that can deliver that message and um, more people to connect to the community in that capacity, right? So here are the benefits. The notification is a conversation again. It's that conversation at the kitchen table where we're talking to one another, human to human, person to person, right? Mom to mom, in one case this past week, um, mother's uh, child was shot and she was at her wit's end. And I'm a mother, although my sons have never been uh, hurt in that capacity, being a mother of three sons, I can only imagine, right? And so when she's crying, I understand. I'm hurting for my child, right? So we can have that dialogue and I can say, hey, mom, I know it hurts, but we're gonna have to ask you to let us handle it from this end. Let us take care of this and let's see how we can take care of you. So let's get you some counsel. And let's do what we need to help take care of you and this family. Um, we're hoping that all of this is to save a life. And ultimately, it could help reduce retaliatory violence in Kansas City. Any questions, I would like to take them at this time. Wow, that, that is a great presentation. So did you work with NOVA when it was up and running? I did, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, how, how many years did you work with NOVA? I came in in 2016. I started in the burn grant. All right. And so this uh, risk retaliation is kind of born out of NOVA? Yes, sir. Because I, I think Chief uh, Smith had a lot to do with putting NOVA in place mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning. And uh, I didn't have so much to do with putting in place, but I was there as a, as a project manager during a, a portion of NOVA. But I think what is really important about this is the carryovers. We wanted to take good things that were working and make sure that we didn't lose those aspects. And this is one of those things. And it's not as originally as designed. There was a lot more people involved. Um, it's come down to um, the police department, again, um, kind of carrying this this forward and making sure that we maintain this and and Sergeant Harris and others have done a great job about bringing in some new partners um, so we can move forward and and keep this up and like I said it, it's a weekly conversation in our shoot review hey what where are we standing on this where's our crimes what's our threats what can we do to do it I mean they're very dedicated like I said they'll get up in the middle of the night and go knock on the door if they need to or go talk to somebody yeah I, I think if people know that uh, there is some alternative to retaliation. Uh, sometimes people just want to feel like somebody is concerned about what I'm going through because retaliation is an emotion that, uh, you know, kind of rises up in, in, a, in a feeling of nobody else cares. So this is, this is a, a great opportunity to show the human side of policing. And uh, it, it, it sounds like um, you have some great concepts in place. And I think to your question, that is something that helps to reduce some of those numbers because retaliation uh, can be, um, <laughs> it just goes on and on and on, you know. Uh, any questions, comments from? Um, I just think that's a great job and um, really glad to hear what success you guys are having with that. Um, so if there's anything we can do to help support that in any way by getting that message out more or something, I think it's just really important because you're at that ground level of meeting with that family and taking that anger and channeling that in the right direction. And I just think that's very powerful. So thank you. 
and you do have direct uh, uh, communication with the social services department? Yes, sir. Good. Uh, and the collaboration has been what you've expected? Yes, sir. Good. Yes, it has. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, commissioners. Uh, now we'll have a brief presentation by the traffic division in regard to uh, DUI enforcement operations. Good morning, Sergeant Corey Carlisle, the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department DUI section. Um, my team is here, my command staff, uh, Captain Cody, my major, and then uh, a couple of my officers from the unit, uh, Davison and, uh, and Franca. So today we want to talk about some of the things that we've, we've seen and how we've, our trajectory over the last four years and where we are today. Uh, first, I'd like to show your attention to the board here. This is the 2021 LEXAC conference. LEXAC is the... Um, Law Enforcement Traffic Safety Advisory Council. Every year they have a conference, the state of Missouri, uh, for all the agencies to come together with uh, traffic related news, best practices, new technology, um, some partners that collaborate with us, MoDOT, um, uh, the Missouri Safety Center, and um, uh, NHTSA, which is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So this year they recognize officers based off their performance uh, from as you can see there's a, a lot of officers up there holding up plaques so from left to right we'll start with officer Jeremy White uh, then there's officer Nathan Majors and there's officer Ryan Kagan and officer Douglas Davidson then myself Sergeant Carlisle and officer Jordan and Franca and we have Captain Cody uh, we only have one officer I wasn't there and that was Sean Davis so at this conference our officers brought in three to four separate awards for their performance in 2020. So Officer Davidson received the LETSAC 2020 Officer of the Year Award. So out of all the agencies in the department and the performance for officers, he was recognized as the Officer of the Year for accomplishing uh, 256 DUIs for a single officer uh, for, that, for that year. We also received the NHTSA's People Saving People Award for the unit. And MoDOT has a pin recognition program that they use to um, present to officers who perform uh, individual, individual DUIs. So if you get 100 plus DUIs, then you get uh, a plaque. Uh, if you get 50 or more, then you get a pin. Well, Every officer in the DUI unit got more than 100 DUIs. Uh, so as you can see, all of them received that plaque. And that just goes to show the, the dedication that our unit provides uh, to the city um, and through this department. And that's, that's not to include the awards they got from KCPD, uh, which is special unit citation. Uh, officer Douglason, uh, Officer Douglas Davidson, uh, White, and, and Franca also received the certificate of accommodation uh, for the number of DUIs that they um, got for that year. So this is uh, to show how much have we've done and how much that we dedicate ourselves. And then each agency was ranked throughout the state. Uh, so that information and that, those statistics my captain have, so I'll let him give some information on that. Not specific statistics, but I wanted everybody to know that out of the top eight officers in Missouri, um, our officers took seven of those awards. So that's pretty impressive. Nice. I'm going to go a little bit further into it later on what, during the slide of exactly how well they're doing this year. Uh, but understand that uh, MoDOT has a 100 pin. They didn't have a 200 pin at the time because they've never seen it. And he got 256. Four. I was going to cover that later. Correction, 308. 308 DUIs. Now, some agencies don't pull that off of their entire agency, and we have one officer with our department that 
got 308 DUIs. And, and we still got, what, six days in the grant year? <laughs> or, or two, whether. All right, so this slide here is a snapshot for the last four years just to kind of see how we've come. So the first line at the top for 2018 is the number of DUIs, and this is for the grant year. So to be, to be specific, the grant year runs from, the fiscal grant year runs from October 1st to September 30th every year. So in 2018, there was 387 DUIs conducted by the DUI section. This is not for the, the department as a whole. In 2019, we increased to 536, which was a 38% increase from 2018. From 2019 to 2020, we, we broke a record and hit 1,046, which is, was a 95% increase. So in 2021, when this presentation was completed, we were at 1,296. I think right now we're at 1,314. That was a 24% increase uh, from 2020. Cars stopped in 2019. Uh, as we do our saturation patrols, we, we, we go out and we stop vehicles from violations. So in 2018, that was 1,329. Uh, there was a 5% decrease in 2019 to 1,260. Um, in 2020, we increased those numbers by 30% to 1,634. Now, you will notice there's a decrease in 2021 down to 1,210, and there's asterisks by that number. And there's a very, very good reason why that occurred, and I will just explain that a little later. Uh, tickets issued, uh, whether for the various violations, and these also include the DUI tickets, uh, they do not include the state charges. So uh, 2018, 1,112, there's a 14% increase in 2019 from 1,265. Uh, from 2019 to 2020, there was a 46% increase to 1,844 citations issued. And in 2021, we're currently, currently at 2,227, which is a 21% uh, increase. Below there, you'll see the pie charts. Starting from the left, uh, there's a representation, a comparison between 2020 and 2021. This is our case file type uh, based off the uh, the arrest level. So for our city cases in 2020, 63% of our overall DUIs were city, 20% were state, and 16% were case files. So case files are our felony charges that we sent over to our TIS, Traffic Investigations Unit section. And then in 2021, our CD cases went from 63% to 73%. Our state cases went from 20% to 26%, and case files, uh, reduced from 16% to 1%. Um, and the reason for that is my command staff made an adjustment and a change. Um, we were streamlining efficiencies. It gave us more time to go out and do uh, enforcement activity. So TIS took over handling the case files, which is uh, very, very time consuming. So that gave us more time to go out and be in the community, on the streets, highways, and uh, on the side roads and the main thoroughfares. So our activity type from 2020 to 2021, these, these are breaking down into several categories. Uh, grant, which are our grant funded operations. And then the CO is call outs. Uh, those numbers are relatively low because we generally work the hours that you will be called out since we work overnight. Uh, and then SI is for self-initiated and CFS is calls for service. So in 2020, you will notice that the grants were 40% and the cost for service were 47%. Self-initiated was 10% and the call-outs were 3%. We switched over, we go to 2021, our cost for service increased almost 10%. So we're at 55%, our, our grant numbers decreased by 35%. Um, call-outs are pretty consistent and self-initiated is pretty consistent. What's important there, which is a fundamental objective that I had when I took over a unit, uh, I've been there a year and a half, is focusing on the importance of assisting the field, uh, assisting manpower. And there's a, a, a fundamental understanding on why that worked and why these numbers shift. And I wanted to let my major explain how, uh, how that dynamic 
works and um, how it's switched over. Uh, they, they've done a remarkable job overall. The traffic division is kind of involved in everything. Um, part of this was that the messaging that they sent out uh, originally was that we want to start offering this patrol to take the vehicular access. Could you come to the mic? Yeah, so that they can hear you on the TV. And they, they wanted to make sure that we were augmenting patrol for staffing shortages and they started taking vehicular accidents. So it, it took a while for the messaging to seed, but as soon as it did, um, we started taking a tremendous amount of vehiculars. I think we take, I mean, we take as many as we can right now. What did we take last year? Four. Total? Yeah. Over fatalities yeah. or? Yeah. Okay, let's say. So, I mean, I'm going to go over that in a little bit. <coughs> so the messaging was important to get that out. I kind of want to go over the numbers that we're talking about here, the 1,046 and 1,296. I tried to find this to see if other agencies were doing any tracking on this. Nobody's doing tracking. I wanted to see where we ranked national because I like bragging on these guys. So, but I did notice that uh, individual awards are being handed out for different states, whether it be Illinois, California, Nevada, what have you, at 113, 120, 140. Uh, my lowest guy has 150. This guy has 308, and this guy has 215. So it's just absolutely <coughs> amazing that every one of them would be doing well in any state. So, go ahead, Corey. Thank you. So expounding on the difference between the calls for service um, and the self-initiated. So in 2020, our grant calls for service were 177. What I mean for calls for services, officers are calling us to come and handle their DUIs for them. What's important about that is because we're freeing them up to go and handle more substantial calls throughout the city, whether it be an accident or just a traffic violation for stopping an impaired driver. A DUI can take anywhere from an hour to two hours for a field officer com to complete. Uh, because we're experts, we do it every single day, it can take us from 30 minutes to 45 minutes to do mm. um, So. In 2020, those costs for service were $177. As our major explained, so 2021, with that robust uh, plan that we put in place to try to increase officers' reliability on us, that increased to 433. So we had we saw a 144% increase in grant calls for service in one year. Um, and that's what caused the, the number of vehicles to, to drop because our self-initiated decreased 12% but our call for service increased 144%. So that's why I put that asterisk in there. All right, this is our DUI, oh, those lines in there, DUI toxicology report. So as a supervisor of the unit, I manually track every single DUI that these guys have. So for 1,296 CRNs, I manually input into a spread uh, Excel spreadsheet and I input the data and I track it and I use it so my officers know where they're at on a daily basis and my command staff at some point will understand where we're at on a, 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 a weekly and monthly basis as well. So with this information here it just shows 2021. Uh, I broke down the top where you see the DUI crash data. These are crashes that my officers took the initiative to respond to to assist the field officers in looking for impaired drivers. So in 2021, we had 520 uh, crashes that just my officers, remember this is not for the department as a whole, responded to compared to, um, compared to 2020 where we had 356. So there was a 45% increase in my officers responding uh, to crashes. So out of our total of 1,296 DUIs, the crashes represent about 40% of our total DUIs, which is, which is relatively high. So out of those 520 crashes, 140 of them resulted in blood draws. All right, And I broke down the results of those blood draws, those toxicology reports that we get back from Children's Mercy Hospital into five major, well, four major categories. So we have alcohol. So of those 140, well, 124, because 16 are still pending, 33% uh, responded with alcohol in their system. 42 responded with THC or a combination of THC. 13% responded with PCP and 6% responded with drugs. 
The NEG represents negative, so there was no reporting. Nothing came back in their system um, from that toxicology report. So far, our unit has conducted a total of 275 uh, toxicology reports. Um, that is a 17% increase from 2020. So we're seeing more drivers who are operating a motor vehicle on the influence of drugs uh, steadily increase. So of those that we've tested, 73% were tested at roadside, whether or not they provided a breath sample or they refused altogether. And 27% of those were processed at the hospital due to injuries or blood draws. Uh, refusal rates here in Kansas City are increasing. Uh, our Jackson, Platt, Clay, and Cass County are no refusal counties. Uh, we have a high uh, persistent and prior offenders. So generally when they refuse, then we can seek a search warrant uh, for their blood. Um, and that process can take anywhere from four to six hours. One of the things that we definitely understood in this process is an increase in our, our, our blood draws. And so we wanted to, to make um, a unilateral approach to that to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible um, in our approach to handling that, that aspect of it. Data here, we were able to uh, figure out that uh, we, we can stay ahead of exactly what's trending out there. So working with uh, the crime lab, we were able to identify like the nine top drugs that were found, and we were actually testing when we got there up to 36, up to 100 to a 300 panel. So you can imagine how expensive that was. So we cut it down to the regular nine, giving ourselves an option to still use the big panel if we ever have to and we were able to reduce the cost of this things by tens of thousands of dollars. And getting rid of Widmark on top of it too is because we were taking two vials of blood. We saw it unnecessary to take two vials of blood, so we saved almost 100% in just our lab results. Mm -hmm. I have to sign off on those things, and man, those things are big. So I was, I was very glad that we started tracking this exactly this way. Now, tomorrow he could tell me, we need, to, we need to look at this. Fentanyl is getting to be the next big thing. And then I'll change the panel to address just that as well. And, and Whitmark is a scientific formula used to track the, elim the average elimination rate from a, hu from a human body um, based off the, the substance, whether it be drugs or alcohol. So they take two samples. They use uh, uh, generally between an hour, hour and a half apart, and they, and they use the variance between the two uh, levels. So if, say, your BAC was at 0.2, and then an hour later, it dropped down to a 0.15 or a 0.1. So they used that average to say whether or not you were actually increasing at the time of the crash or where you were decreasing at the time of the crash. And they can also use that to extrapolate what your actual intoxication level would have been at the exact pinpoint of the crash. Um, but th there are so many variables, you have to have an expert to testify on a wit mark. So, um, a lot of counties hire, use, use that function, but um, it's, it's not as viable as we would uh, like it to be. So on top of all the hard work and getting, setting record numbers for DUIs and changing the culture of how the field uh, uses, uses uh, the DUI unit to handle their DUIs, we're also in the community. We have a youth alcohol outreach program that we use where, uh, well, pre-COVID, we were going to high schools, we were going to colleges and universities and doing presentations, explaining to young drivers uh, the, the importance of uh, not operating a vehicle while under the influence of a substance of alcohol or anything other than alcohol. Uh, we have what we call simulated drunk goggles where uh, students can put them on and it can simulate what impairment would be performing basic psychophysical motor function skills, such as walking or uh, catching a ball, and they realize how much more challenging that is when their vision is obscured or, or, or blurred, which is what those goggles simulate. So they're, they're able to, to see the, the proposed dangers that they could face if they were operating a vehicle. Uh, we also encourage, you know, hey, the buddy system, you know, don't drive your car, or don't ride in a car with somebody that's high on marijuana or, or use prescription medication or, or using alcohol. Um, let, let, let a responsible adult know. 
Um, and so it's usually perceived pretty well. Uh, they like to see all our, our lights and our equipment that we have. My officers are really good and engaging. Uh, you can see Davis there was uh, tasked with uh, making some hot dogs and some <laughs> some hamburgers for the for the, for the kids on, on the scene. So uh, we use an educational aspect of our job and our function as well. Um, getting getting hit with a DUI is an expensive lesson, but if we can get to the kids and teach them early uh, prior to it, because at the end of the day we're we're, we're saving lives. We're seeing people. Uh, perish from car crashes, whether they be the victim or uh, the perpetrator in that in that incident instance. So we get really good reception for it. Uh, we generally work overnight, but we find time during the day to make sure that we are at public events. We partner with our, uh, our our CIOs, community interaction officers on the department, so they let us know uh, what a lot of events that are going on um, in the community. And we've also had co uh, local companies reach out to our unit to come give presentations to their employees about, you know, workplace safety, you know, because, you know, companies are having employees come to work impaired uh, by substances, either alcohol or drugs. Uh, so, and we also are a good resource for school resource officers because we can, we can show them what signs and symptoms to look for when you're dealing with students, because uh, we've all, pretty much to some degree seeing someone that's drunk by alcohol. We, we recognize the odor, we kind of understand some of the things that we see, but when you ask them, well, what does someone look like when they're under the influence of Xanax? What does someone look like when they're under the influence of PCP? What do they look like when they're under the influence of cannabis? Well, we're DREs, we're drug recognition experts. We are taught the clinical signs of what to look for outside of the standard uh, field sobriety test to, to be able to pinpoint those uh, indicators and we can teach educators we can teach school resource officers on what to look for so they can pinpoint those issues out in students and that can help schools uh, stay stay ahead of, of, of that that issue um, my captain mentioned it earlier we are been seeing a, a, a increase in fentanyl um, in this area and also PCP um, fentanyl is an opiate uh, synthetic <laughs> and it is usually combined with another substance, uh, usually marijuana, or in some instances, PCP. Um, it's a very dangerous substance, but um, it heightens the high and it makes it last longer and, and, and people go for it. So the last slide here is uh, some of the things that we use as marketing campaign for our, for our unit. We, um, we developed a, a newsletter that we put out three to four times a year. Um, it has information in it, which include hot topics from officers, DUI updates, issues that we've observed in the unit. Um, we recognize officers at individual division stations, and we'll also put information in there about uh, DUI challenge coin that Officer and Franca was able to get developed for our unit. Uh, MoDOT was so impressed with the program, they opted to buy the coins for us. Uh, and what we do is we recognize officers in the field who are doing DUI uh, impairment enforcement, whether it be from a crash or accident. Um, and we've gotten incredible feedback from officers. As you saw the, er the numbers earlier, our 144% uh, increase um, in the field calling for DUI officers to come and handle their, their, their DUIs for them is a direct result of the, uh, the newsletter and the DUI Challenge Coin marketing campaign that we implemented. Um, and we, we love to recognize our units and any commanders or supervisors are out there. If you have any guys, shoot us an email. We'll be more than willing to recognize them and to shoot them a coin. Um, we've gotten great reception from it and it, 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 it works. Every day we take a drunk off the street, we save a life. Uh, I don't think that there is a coincidence that uh, our fatals have dropped in a, with the number of DUIs that we have increased on. And uh, I'll let my captain talk to you about, about those numbers as well. To conclude this thing, I want everybody to understand, you know, like two years ago we were at 500 DUIs a year. Now they've done 1,300 this year. This year, the fatalities have went up in the state of Missouri by about two and a half percent. We're down 22 percent. Can I say these guys are responsible? Yeah, I'm going to say it. They're responsible. So if 
but I think it's the whole traffic division as a whole because we're starting to work together and we actually see the results. 22%, that's going to be hard to explain that we're not uh, at least contributing to lower income. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. Great report. Yeah, yeah, Chief. I just wanted to give them a shout out. I, I know they've gotten several awards, but they really have put a huge effort and, and true concern in trying to lower that fatality rate. And I, I, I will tell you, this is not an easy job. They work when most of us are sleeping. Um, they have to deal with people that are very challenging in yeah. very challenging states. Um, it, 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 to show and to have that many dealings and to come out that successful all the time really shows the commitment they have. And I, I just wanted to give them a, a public shout out. They're doing a tremendous job for all of us. We appreciate it. Oh, thank thank you, you very much. Absolutely. And thank you for your Good presentation. Job. I mean, it's yeah. helpful for us to see. I mean, we see the numbers, but thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Two excellent presentations on what KCPD is doing to help save lives in the city. Uh, returning back to uh, tab D, I'll now discuss case submissions to county prosecutors. During the month of August, KCPD submitted a total of 395 cases to county prosecutors' offices. Charges were filed in 143 cases during the month. 42 cases were charged in custody and 101 warrants were issued. 35 cases were returned for additional work and 208 cases were declined during the month. 98 of those cases were narcotics related. There was approximately a 4% increase in the total number of cases presented to county prosecutors offices during the month of August of 2021 compared to August of 2020. There was a 20% decrease in the total number of cases charged by county prosecutors' offices in August of 2021 compared to August of 2020. From January 1 through August 31st, 2021, we submitted 3,070 cases to county prosecutors' offices. That's a 5% increase over the number of cases we presented during the same time period in 2020. Charges were filed in 1,148 of those cases. And that's a 19% decrease from the charges filed during the same period in 2020. And subject to your questions, that concludes my report. The 98% that you said were narcotics related? 98 cases of those cases, cases that were declined during the month. And were those all Jackson County? Not all, but primarily they had the largest percentage okay. Thank you. Uh, a lot of great reports uh, showing us um, you know, what is being done to to make sure that our uh, citizens are, are safe uh, and a lot of times you know people only look at the the side where they're being arrested but they don't think about the lives is they're saving because they've been arrested. So uh, you have to have a, an, an open mind when you look at these kind of things. Thank you. Uh, great reports. Um, Can I ask one question? Yes. Uh, I noticed on the in terms of the declinations, it, for violent crimes uh, in Jackson County, there were an awful lot of declinations as well, not just uh, drug enforcement but particularly sex crimes, domestic violence, and juvenile. To what do you attribute all of the declinations in those categories? Uh, generally, it's because of witness cooperation or family cooperation. Um, sometimes they're just not able to over, overcome those challenges. If I could add to that, a lot of times we have cooperating witnesses the day of but we cannot get any follow-up after that. So we might get someone who says, hey, I want, I want to file on this case, but we'll ask them to come in for further you know, statements, maybe get DNA, whatever the case may be, and then they won't contact us and we'll reach out and reach out and not make contact. So we, we still have 
challenges in that area to try and get cooperation. And some of these, you know, even though it's just reported for the month, some of these cases like, hey, the prosecutor will say on a violent crime, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to put this back to you right now. When you get the DNA results, you can submit it back. So some of these may go back for another submission. It's not a final conclusion on, on all of these. Um, so they're, they're, uh, it's hard to capture cases in a month by case because it's an ongoing process and it goes on for a long time sometimes. I mean, we have homicide cases that go on for years, right? And we mm -hmm. file a case 20 years later. It may have been declined several times at the time of the homicide and then we get another piece of information or another person comes forward and we resubmit the case again. So just. Just keep all that in mind when we look at the numbers. It's, it's very hard to pinpoint the exact state of the case and saying it's completely done. That may not be the issue. Thank you, Chief. Um, next uh, report is Community Outreach Social Services Program. Uh, Ms. Tori Coleman. Well, good morning. My name is Tori Common. I am the social services support liaison here for Kansas City Police Department. And I have a quick presentation for you over some of the efforts going on at our Northland patrol divisions. Uh, we have a particular story that just really touched our hearts and we wanted to share with you. Um, a difficult story, but a just good example of the work that's being done here with this department. One morning this summer, a residence north of the river was engulfed in flames. As fire and first responders arrived to the scene, it was soon learned that there were still children inside of the home. A female 15 years of age was pulled from the smoke, but unfortunately, three boys, ages 10, four, and three, were still inside the home as the flames spread. Ultimately, the three boys did not make it. The day of social services specialist Trina Miller was contacted by a sergeant and informed of the events. From there, Ms. Miller worked to contact the father of the 10 year old and other family members. After speaking with the family, an officer and Ms. Miller went to the residence and met with them so that they could find out their needs. Quickly, Ms. Miller realized the families had many needs that were quite urgent. Ms. Miller kept in constant contact with families to address those needs. For example, Ms. Miller contacted trauma services through Truman Medical Center and discussed availability, coverage, and more. She then contacted UMKC Community Counseling and individual trauma providers. By doing this legwork, Ms. Miller was able to find the right providers who were able to work with the family when they were ready to start processing their trauma. Ms. Miller also worked with the families on many of their basic needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. For example, she made sure there was food in the home to take care of their necessities right then. She also made sure that there was food available for any of the after, fam after funeral family gatherings that they had. Uh, as the home was a complete loss, Ms. Miller also assisted with clothing needs. Clothes were provided through our team's clothing closets and other donations. And Ms. Miller was able to liaison between the families and the Red Cross in order to walk them through the process to get vouchers for housing and shelter. Along with assisting those basic needs, Ms. Miller also acted as a liaison and support for the family while they interacted with multiple complex systems that arise from a tragedy like this. These systems included the police department itself, fire department, funeral homes, medical examiners, and children's division. She consistently contacted her command staff at North Patrol to inform them where the families were, their current status, and their needs. She fielded questions from our juvenile section and bomb and arson. She worked with one of the fathers to get all of his questions answered from beginning to the end. Ms. Miller assisted with funeral homes to find the best location to fit the family's needs, and she has continued to do so much more. Any and all legwork that Ms. Miller could do for these families, she has done. In a tragedy like this, there are so many things that need addressed and phone calls that need to be made to so many of these larger systems. 
but oftentimes families are shuffled from person to person to person on these phone calls. Meanwhile, they're dealing with their grief in the situation. By uh, Ms. Miller acting as a liaison to these complex systems, she ensured that the one number or person that she connected them to was actually the person they needed. It was the person who could help provide support and answers immediately. This event is just an example of how one moment in time can affect so many people and so many systems. This tragic event impacted three blended families, four children overall, not including the two children who were not in the home at the time of the fire. It involved numerous agencies, hospitals, resources, and systems. Ms. Miller was able to navigate through all of them in order to assist these families during their time of grief and still stays connected with these families to this day so she can help walk them through the trauma that comes after. Thank you. Any questions? No. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. It, it's wonderful to hear this and it, it, you know, it shows about the concern, you know, it all started with the sergeant who made that scene, who then started the process rolling and that's exactly the way our social service program is set up so that our district people when, and any of our officers come across that situation. But I, it, it's hard to articulate just, you know, these are hard circumstances, three kids getting killed in a fire and, and you know, the police department is basically being there as through everything, through the whole process of everything that's going on. And, you know, I, I, I'd like to say that social services gets all the credit and, uh, that they deserve, but they probably don't. I mean, they, they're ha helping families like this. This is just one pickup, but we're doing this day in and day out across the city uh, at all six patrol divisions. So just wanted the board and the public to know how, how dedicated they are into helping people when, you know, frankly, many of these people might not have had anyone to turn to. All right. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Tori. Good morning, Commissioners. We're going to have, I'm Major Stacy Graves sitting in for Colonel True. Uh, Officer Cooley is going to give a presentation of our involvement with Faith in Blue. Morning. Morning. Mm -hmm. Honor here to be, to be here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity. I wanted to start the presentation off with this picture. Um, a lot of people say a picture says a thousand words. I think this one says about 10,000. I want you to just take an opportunity and just soak this picture in for a moment. This is actually down on the plaza in the midst of the riots and protests. Chaplain Reverend Modest Miles called up, and when he calls up, you take the call. <laughs> That's the equivalent of a chief of police, but in faith circles, right? And he called up, and he seen what was going on down in the plaza, and he wanted to activate his team of Baptist ministers to come down and meet with the officers, meet with the chief, meet with the leadership. So I responded out to his church where they literally loaded two shuttle buses full of pastors and chaplains, a handful of chaplains gathered with them as well. Uh, both of these gentlemen standing behind me right here um, were very cri critical in what I call this moment a, a pivot point in our time down on the plaza and what we were dealing with. So literally this group of pastors came up and they met on top of the parking garage with the chief of police as well as other uh, command staff with the police department. They took an opportunity to observe from the rooftop. They took an opportunity to get a debrief on what was going on from our standpoint and what was happening. They took the opportunity to pray over uh, the chief, over the leadership, over the mayor, over the city, over the protesters, over the entire situation they wanted God in that moment. And when we got done, uh, we came back down, getting ready to head back to the shuttle buses to leave. 
and looking around at a bunch of police officers that were sitting there in their gear getting ready to go out and, and face another battle that evening, um, we fanned out the chaplains to go around and ask the officers sitting around who quite honestly just looked defeated. They were tired, they were sweaty, they were humiliated. Uh, they had a very rough time that they were dealing with out there on the front lines. And when they fanned out and asked, uh, would anybody like to come into the mi middle of the intersection at Nichols and Wyandotte and receive prayer, this is the amount of officers that, that came out, roughly 30 or 40, that were surrounded by roughly the same amount of pastors and chaplains that took a moment to just pause and bow their heads and, and pray to God. It was a very pivotal moment, a very powerful moment, and quite honestly, it, it was something that, that just naturally segued into National Faith in Blue. So I wanted to take a little bit of a moment and, and share the behind the scenes and the power of this moment in this picture. Um, fast forward a little bit, and, and I do want to pause and say that both of these chaplains were, were very instrumental. Uh, Pastor Miles in, in um, activating that response. Uh, Chaplain LaGuardia, who also went out personally to Mill Creek Park for a prayer, prayer event to try to help move things uh, forward in our city at that time. But uh, we can't thank either one of you guys enough for, for what you guys have done for the department and for this city and helping move things forward at that critical moment, that pivot point that we're just talking about. So thank you both very much. So you fast forward a little bit, uh, roughly August time frame is when Chief became aware of National Faith in Blue. Um, and it was time. Let's, let's get this moving, let's participate. It was a difficult time for us to strike up, uh, which once were traditional partnerships and being able to push forward with engagement. Uh, you guys are familiar with Scott Lamaster and our Friday night fun nights. and. You know, we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to engage the community without him, and I will say the same thing about National Faith in Blue because it, it brought national level partnerships to the table to bring police and community and faith communities together at a time where it was greatly strained by George Floyd, riots and protests, uh, the pandemic. I, I think our department has faced a time uh, in this moment in this season that, that no one has had to face before from your leadership standpoint, the leadership of the department, the leadership in this city, this town, we're, we're all dealing with a lot, but um, we got after it. And, and this is a testament to the strength of KCPD's community engagement in my opinion, because in just a two month time frame, we partnered and activated four community events um, Correction, eight, eight community events in a four-day time frame that second weekend in October. So roughly in a two-month time frame, we were off to the races and we were getting after it. So National Faith in Blue, this was their first annual event in 2020. I just wanted to provide you guys a quick recap. They were actually in the process of planning for this in 2019 with an intention to activate in the spring. Um, with obviously everything that was going on, it got delayed and then pushed back and, and fell into that October time frame. Uh, last year's events across the nation, roughly 1,000 events celebrated by law enforcement agencies around the nation. Uh, again, KCPD provided eight engagement events that weekend with about two months time frame notice, which we were pulled together uh, very nicely in my opinion. Uh, a huge partner that we have to give props to is Harvesters. Harvesters was huge last year. Uh, Steve Davis, uh, the head of that organization, could call me at three in the morning tonight with a need and I would get up and go help. That's how amazing they were for us. And uh, they were a critical point in, in helping, quite honestly, in, in addition to multiple other <coughs> you know, faith partner, partners and entities, KCPD directly providing uh, roughly 535,000 meals to the residents in Kansas City, Missouri last year. So. They partnered with us again. We did three large scale food distributions, which that contributed to that number I just shared. We did a prayer vigil. We also did a peace parade, all, all of which were very well attended. So I wanna skip forward to 2021 now and share a promotional video about three minutes long and it's a promotional video of National Faith in Blue for this year's events. Reverend Markel uh, Hutchins is the head of that organization, Movement Forward Inc. We come today to the nation's capital to this 
hallowed and sacred space called the National Law Enforcement Museum because there's a sickness in our country of division and dissension. We have the capacity as a country and as a nation to turn our pain into power, to focus not on the things that divide us, but the things that unite us. Abcoa recognized years ago that the relationship between law enforcement and faith-based organizations, churches, synagogues, mosques, and temples was essential if we were going to serve the communities in their time of need. We also partner with our faith-based organizations to support these victims of all crimes, but particular, particularly violent crimes. Every single one of those officers go into that community, they live in those communities, they're part of those communities, they're part of the churches, they're, they're fathers, they're mothers, they're Sunday school teachers, they're volunteer firemen, they're in the National Guard. They're all very much invested in our communities and I'm convinced there's not a problem in this country we can't fix if we all sat down and committed ourselves to finding real solutions to real problems. I'm confident that brighter days are ahead based on partnerships like Faith in Blue to ensure that we align to rebuild trust and enhance accountability while forging a constructive path forward. Building mutual trust and respect in our law enforcement community and the public is a vital tenant to effective and sound policing. By partnering with our faith-based communities, National Faith in Blue Weekend offers a unique way to reinforce connections between policing professionals and the communities that they serve. You know, as a little girl in Memphis, Tennessee, there was two entities that were there. That was the church and the police. And even today, it is still the cornerstone of our communities. Cynicism should die. Doubt should perish. Optimism should prevail. We exist for the communities that we serve. At the end of the day, really what it comes down to is it's all about relationships. It's all about that interaction, about the common goals and a common respect of what we have for each other. And Faith in Blue gives us an opportunity to do just that. It gives us an opportunity to have that one, that one conversation about who we are, personalizing who we are. When you know people and you listen to people and you respect people, then you, have, you find ways in order to be able to build those relationships. Why do we do this? We do this not for religious purposes, but we do this because of the officers that give themselves in service every single day. It's about the officers that risk their lives we do this for people like my mother, 73-year-old widow, who is the best human being I've ever known. I want my mother to be able to go to Walmart or Target without fear of being attacked. We do this for the officers that gave themselves in service to protect our democracy on January 6th. We do this because we have faith in our collective humanity and faith in one another. Every faith-based organization and every law enforcement agency is urged to get involved by participating in the 2021 National Faith in Blue Weekend, Friday, October 8th through Monday, October 11th. For more information, visit faithinblue.org or contact the national office. So I, I chose this personal or this picture uh, intentionally as well. I, I know Chief's not a big fan of being highlighted, <laughs> but uh, this be, this picture speaks volumes to me. Number one for our chief's dedication, and I'm not afraid to stand up here and 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 sing his praises for what he has endured over the course of this last year and a half on behalf of this department in our city. Um, we're up here talking earlier about, you know, homicide numbers going down dramatically. I'm not saying that's the police department, you know, only. That, that's our partners. That's everybody. But nonetheless, he's in leadership and at the helm of overseeing this progress in, in a time that, uh, let's just say it's just tough times. I don't want to dive too far into the weeds. But uh, his level of dedication, um, I can't think of one time uh, that he's missed one of those Friday night fun nights that he's given up time away from his family and his granddaughters to, to be there to support the officers and to engage the community. And that's a, a time where, again, we've had those strained relationships, those tough times, and we've really had to be at the forefront of creating our own opportunities even more so to engage with the community with partners like Scott Lamaster, like I said. So it, it's an honor, sir. Thank you. Um, 
We've been working this year in light of last year's successes with our turnaround and our eight, eight events and our engagement. Um, the National Faith and Blue Movement Forward, Inc., the one that uh, uh, collaborates and, and organizes on a national level, all of these agencies across the nation to participate, actually reached out to us um, and wanted us to work closer with them to help them with uh, their program and what they're trying to do around the country. So about six months we've been kind of doing some conversations and collaborations, some working group collaborations, some um, consults and whatnot, so to speak. Um, in typical Chief Smith fashion, though, he's always thinking about others. Uh, you know, KCPD has been involved with this, but he made the decision that we should bring this organization in, this national organization into Kansas City, get them here to come and speak at the Metro Chiefs and Sheriff's Association luncheon to share the wealth, so to speak, with these other agencies and get them on board. After that presentation, countless other chiefs of police and sheriffs came forward to get business cards and to get engaged in this program as well. So if our local, local news media gets involved and, and you start to see more uh, of National Faith and Blue events popping up around the metro, that's because of Chief Smith's, leader, Smith's leadership and bringing others to the table. Um, I got to sing the, the praises and the props of the CIOs, the community interaction officers. They've got more on their plates than they ever have. Um, and they've been working their tails off. So we, we are literally jumping up from about eight community engagement events last year's Faith and Blue to 12. Uh, this year over that four-day time frame, which is October 8th through October 11th. Um, and then for the first time, uh, a couple of our KCPD chaplains, our chaplain program in essence is actually stepping up and taking leadership on a large-scale community event as well. It's all hands on deck in our engagement. So chaplains, if I could get you guys to provide a flyer. to the camera. I couldn't get this slide to come through quite as well as I, I would have liked. It's a little fuzzy, so I thought we would bring you some hard copies of these as well so you can see them better. Would you give it to the man that's running the camera? Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your work. So as we run down the list on the flyer here, this is all of our events, October 8th through October 11th. Um, on that Friday, uh, the 8th, we've got a National Faith and Blue Prayer Breakfast, uh, a blood drive, uh, a Friday night fun night, and a crime prevention night. And these events are spread out through the city, north and south. On October 9th, uh, we decided to bring in a human trafficking workshop. Uh, Pre-pandemic, pre-riots, protests, this topic uh, surfaced quite a bit in the community and then obviously other issues arose, but this topic is coming up more and more. So Chief decided to bring in something to offer up to our faith communities from a training standpoint to also empower them. It's a way of us to also thank them for their service and partnership with us. In addition to that, uh, the training is also going to be offered up internally at our academy for officers that want to sign up for it and, and uh, become more equipped with more tools in their tool bag to, to identify those types of issues. South Kansas City Block Party, uh, KCPD and Harvesters Food Distribution, and another National Faith and Blue Prayer Breakfast. And then on October 10th, uh, and this is the event that is actually chaplain-led, uh, is our KC Chiefs Tailgate Party. Um, I think everybody could get on board with that, right? Uh, I'll have the chaplain speak a little bit more to that here momentarily. And then October 11th is the South Kansas City Peace Parade and then the Freedom Hoops basketball game. I want to highlight a little bit more on the basketball game. This vision was actually the Chief's vision to have a community basketball game between cops and community, um, which is a great idea. It's going to be at the East Patrol uh, Division uh, Gymnasium. Officer Pat Bird, the CI over there, once he learned that's what the Chief wanted, he got the work, got it done, uh, pulled it off with Freedom Hoops. And uh, uh, we're also getting uh, some talk radio uh, assistance with that with Pete Mundo. So that's going to be a great event as well. And then that being said, um, KCPD was actually one of 15 agencies around the, next, uh, the nation in this National Faith and Blue movement to be selected uh, and designated to choose a marquee event. Um, I will let the chaplains, since the marquee event is going to be the tailgate, uh, this year, the Chief's tailgate. I will let the chaplain speak more to that event. 
An incredible privilege it is for us to lead as chaplains. And uh, Pastor Miles will talk about this event a little bit more, but our heart behind everything is that we would provide the community and faith-based organizations to come and be able to say thanks. And what a better way to do that in Kansas City than a tailgate party. <laughs> so we're gonna work together with harvesters. We're gonna see food come out. We're gonna have some barbecue contests. Some smokers are gonna be there. We have games for the children. We have family events that will be happening. And we are really excited about this because all the chaplains are on board. This is not a one-stop show. We're all coming together. And we have the privilege of, of uh, hosting this at Morning Star Baptist Church. So Pastor Miles. Thank you so much, Chaplain. We are looking for each of you because we plan to block off uh, some of our streets in order to have room for our community. And this is a time that we want the officers and the community to come together and say that we can make a difference uh, in our city by working together. So we are asking that we all put forth a special effort. We put forth a special effort uh, with uh, the community. I will be meeting on uh, with the uh, <clears throat> ministers on Tuesday, uh, today week, and saying, look, bring all of, get all of your congregation, let them know what's happening and how we can come together. We are asking uh, the board, the chief, uh, and the chief's uh, uh, leaders to make, for, make a special effort so that we can make this one of the things that we say to our community, we are together and we can make a difference. We can, uh, by working together, we can work together to stop violence. And that's our, our responsibility in that of our city. Our city has, is noted for being one of the cities that uh, cooperate, work together and make a difference. So as part of this effort with the tailgate, we've decided to do something and, and support harvesters. I spoke earlier about how, how harvesters has been a huge supporter of us. We're going to work to support them. We're going to make this a canned food drive. Um, so we're going to have donation barrels. Harvesters is going to have set up for this event, this tailgate event. We're also going to have uh, donation barrels distributed at each division station. All this information will be pushed out through our CIOs and our media unit to make sure everybody knows in the community to support uh, those in need through this event. Um, also, as part of that, we reached out to Buffalo, New York Police Department. Um, another reason we wanted to highlight this event is because Kansas City has the national stage and we share it with Buffalo, New York that evening in Sunday Night Football, Chiefs versus the Bills. So there's the tie-in. We're, we're trying to reach out. To, I know National Faith in Blue, as a result of the uh, marquee event designation, their media has reached out to the NFL. I know our local uh, media unit is working to reach out to the Chiefs. Uh, Buffalo to the Bills. Um, I'm not sure how that's just going to play out just yet. Uh, the captain that we were working with in, in Buffalo, New York, uh, fell ill, was in the emergency room for three days, and we've kind of lost communication a tiny bit with that. So we're still going to follow up. Thoughts and prayers his way, uh, of course, all day long. Captain uh, uh, Champion with the Buffalo, New York Police Department. Definitely in our thoughts and prayers. So Here's some KCPD National Faith in Blue 20, 2021 facts. Uh, last year, again, 1,000 events across the nation by law enforcement agencies. Uh, they're estimating roughly 1,700 events this year. I know Movement Forward Inc. has been flying all over the country trying to recruit, get more people involved. This year, law enforcement from 45 states will be participating. Uh, KCPD, again, is one of 15 departments across the nation designated with that marquee event. And then KCPD rocks, ranks, we do rock, but we rank uh, top 10 nationally for number of events provided for National Faith and Blue Weekend. Uh, we're, we're beat out by agencies to the tune of uh, 90 events like New York, which is huge, right? They can do those types of things, but very proud of that designation. And then I wanted to wrap it up with just a couple of powerful quotes uh, from a couple people within that Movement Forward Inc., that national organization that coordinates these. The first one is from Julie Yaka. She's the National Director of Law Enforcement and Strategic Partnerships for Movement Forward. She says the KCPD is in the top five agencies in the nation for community engagement best practices. Now, this is a group that has touches with agencies across the nation. So I take this statement um, very seriously. Very good mm -hmm. for us, right? Yeah. Awesome. Amazing. Um, 
And then the last one, and, and again, this was uh, in, in that spirit of competition uh, with Buffalo to see who could raise the most canned good items. Uh, Jared Fuhr, uh, uh, Chief Operating Officer for Movement Forward, Inc., uh, put this in an email, and this is just a section of the email. He says, between us and I removed Captain Champion, there's no chance that Buffalo's wings can hold a candle to your barbecue. So <laughs> just wanted to wrap it up with that. But uh, that concludes our presentation, and if anybody has any questions, we're happy to field that for you. Uh, I think you answered uh, all of my questions. It's a great presentation. and. Thank uh, Reverend Miles, uh, Pastor LaGuardia, and Officer Cooley for your uh, work, uh, even from back, you know, during the, the, the riots that we had here in Kansas City up to keeping this going, uh, which I see as a form of prevention, which I'm always looking for prevention. <laughs> yes. Reverend Miles. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, that's a tailgate uh, event. After the tailgate, then you and myself and the chief can go to the suite. I'm still on the sports authority. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'm going to put that on my calendar. <laughs> Is there room for a plus one? <laughs> <laughs> uh. Commissioner, I just wanted to say I, I thank Jason Cooley for, for coordinating this. He, he's actually brought this to us last year. Um, but it, it also highlights another thing, and that is the participation of our department chaplains who, as, as you had asked us to uh, increase that program and inclus increase the engagement, um, these are two of our best who have stepped up and have been very vital in, in not just having um, you know, events, but also participating, communicating back to the community, talking about things. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate, been to Pastor Miles and uh, Pastor LaGuardia is both of their places to uh, participate in events and the interaction and the, and the uh, I don't know, just the, the partnership of all the people that bring it together. I was at Pastor LaGuardia's and here's 7-Eleven and they brought, I don't know how many thousands of hot dogs are cooking. And you know, I thought, how does something like this happen? How do we get all this together? And it's just the relationships of having uh, the pastors involved and bringing some things together. So I just wanted to, I can't thank them enough. Again, they're all volunteers. They don't get paid anything for this and they're putting in countless hours of dedication to try and make things better in this city. And as to Pastor Miles said, this is all to try and reduce violence in our city and get people to get along. And uh, I, I thank them. I thank them for their dedication. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thanks for all your time. All right. Uh, Patrol Division? We're just going to go through these really quick. All right. Uh, first, we had um, Sergeant Wyrock, Jacobs Wyrock. She was recognized by the Kansas City Royals as a hometown hero, uh, presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Kansas City. She was recognized for her work with Battle Within, and those of you who, who may not be familiar with Battle Within, it is a nonprofit serving veterans, first responders, and frontline medical personnel who suffer from PTSD and other traumas. They've assisted many of our members. Um, on September 12th was National Police Woman Day, celebrating women in, in law enforcement. This is a picture, I think it was uh, a year or two ago. Um, <coughs> And we got as many uh, of us together as possible. We, there's more <laughs> that weren't able to make it, but uh, this is actually the second picture that I've been a part of since I've been at KCPD. Um, you can see my head in this one, but okay. Uh, on 9-11, our tactical team, our tactical response teams always participate in a 110 flight of stairs by, by climbing those stairs. This year, uh, being the 20th anniversary, this is a picture of Major Ryan Mills and Captain William Hewitt. Um, I know that they're not dressed out in their gear, but that bag right there, they are carrying a 70-pound bag, and that was just indicative of all the equipment that some of the firefighters and law enforcement officers uh, carried up and down the stairs. Uh, the next picture is of our tactical enforcement or tactile response team uh, that, that also did the 100 time flights of stairs on the anniversary of 9-11. And uh, these guys were in their full gear and uh, one of them is, is holding a sledgehammer as well. Uh, every year our members are involved with Special Olympics uh, and one of those uh, initiatives we 
are part of the wait staff <laughs> at several different locations. And the tips go to uh, support Special Olympics. And this was a group at Corner Cafe. It's fun. And, and some of the people that are there um, eating are kind of surprised at their wait staff. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, we had an event at Harris Park Community or excuse me, we had a community event at Harris Park. Uh, We partnered up with Take It to the Streets. Uh, Community members got the chance to visit with uh, KCPD as well as enjoy a snow, a cold snow cone. I was going to say a cold one, but it's a cold (laughs) snow cone. My apologies. We don't have that at these events. Um, But I will tell you that Take It to the Streets makes really good uh, kettle corn if you ever get a chance to attend one of those events. And then lastly, the Francois Choteau and Native American Heritage uh, Fountain right there off of Choteau Trafficway. It was just recently um, erected, dedicated, and we had a uh, a suspect come and steal one of the 400-pound statues, uh, attempted to take it to get money for scrap. Uh, Our detectives worked hard, reached out to several different... um, scrap yards they were able to locate her um she was in a couple different pieces we were able to to put that back together and we hope that the repairs will be made soon but this is our uh, shoal creek impact squad and our shoal creek property crimes that were the ones that that worked this case and they did not give up until we had recovered her and we recovered her pretty quickly. And also, as you can see, um, councilwoman Heather Hall was also there to, to help us out. The, the erection and the, um, the dedication of this this statue in this area was very important to that part of our city. Uh, just as historically, there's um, a lot of history in that area that I wasn't aware of until um, I was part of this event when it was like the opening ceremony for to, sh- to show the the fountain. And that's all I have. I'm, I'm trying to make this quick, so I'm sorry if I'm kind of get getting along. Uh, I just want to give you a quick update on our risk terrain modeling initiative. Uh, on September, uh, September 9th, uh, some of our members met with the city manager and all of the Kansas City, Missouri City Service Department heads uh, regarding the RTM project. Um, they were able to provide a quick overview of the project and provide our RTM maps and analysis regarding each, t- each patrol division's focus areas. Um, the risk factors and focus areas for each patrol division were discussed, and we explained how KCPD and city services can work together through uh, coordinated resource deployment. So in this, how, how this works, KCPD will complete 311 complaints, which provide Kansas City services the information they need to investigate uh, these locations and potential violations. Uh, our next RTM meeting with Kansas City, Missouri City Services is scheduled for September 30th. So... We um, look forward to continuing that initiative and making areas safer, looking at all all risk factors, whether it be people or places or things that we can do to to help these areas not be conducive for crime. And then my um, all of our stats are on tab F. If you have any questions, I'm sorry, your stats are what? The statistics are under tab F. Our traffic summary and and okay. Some of our crime stats. I didn't have any questions. No, I don't. Either I have any questions on Okay, thank you. Stats. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, department staffing. Good afternoon. Um, The personnel summary is behind tab E. As of August 31st, KCPD has 1,730 employees. 1,730 employees. A breakdown of 1,214 sworn and 511 non-sworn. The budgeted strength should be 2,026. We are missing 296 members. We include September's numbers. We are down to 1,207 law enforcement with 504 non-sworn, a loss of another 14. By the end of 2021, KCPD will be below law enforcement staffing numbers of 1997, when KCPD had 1,185 law enforcement officers. KCPD is quickly approaching law enforcement numbers of the early 1990s setting us back 25 years. 
our current monthly loss is of members average is 17 per month. If this trend continues, KCPD will be below 1,000 law enforcement members by October of 2022. Even with academy classes, KCPD will have law enforcement staffing numbers of the mid 1980s by the end of 2022. We are still continuing to try and hire. Um, as I talked about at the last board meeting, we have BKCPD, which is our recruiting effort. Um, it's going very well. We're seeing um, increased numbers of applicants for non-sworn jobs. Um, we're seeing a large increase in our applicants for our sworn jobs. Our last uh, testing date, we saw 22 people apply to be a law enforcement officer. We have another testing date on Thursday. 36 have signed up. So our numbers are going up. And as you know, we also have an academy class uh, that's in right now. And uh, I'll throw this over to uh, Deputy Chief Mike Wood, and he'll talk about the academy. Uh, my information is under tab C, and then I also have some information in the handouts I gave you before we started. The 172nd class started on June 14th, and they will graduate December 8th. That's an outside class. They started with 14 recruits, and they're down to nine. Hmm. The 173rd started on September 13th, and they graduate in March, um, March 24th. We started that class with 32 Kansas City applicants and 16 outside, um, and we've already lost three from there, and unfortunately all three of those were Kansas City, so we're down to 29 Kansas City. Um, we're still hoping, hoping to get bigger classes for January and March of, of next year, but that's what we have right now. And I will talk a little bit about um, PAL that, that is under me, um, the PAL and DARE sections. We're really seeing a strain. Um, for PAL, we have TO spots for five officers and two sergeants. We just lost one, of, one more officer from PAL, so we're down to two officers in PAL. We have upwards of four to 500 kids a month going through PAL and the services there, we feed up to 250, 300 wheel, meals a week, um, and just all those services are impacted greatly. Um, we find ourselves relying a lot on volunteers, and we have a lot of volunteers, um, but you know, we really need to get more officers in, back into PAL and get fully staffed there. Um, DARE's the same way, it's TO'd for one sergeant and four officers, we currently have one sergeant and two officers. Um, again, greatly impacts the number of people that we can, in mean, schools we can get into and programs that we can do. There's some stuff we're trying to do. We, we just uh, had three officers from the field get certified to be DARE instructors. Um, hopefully, we're gonna be able to get each one of those three to teach a class a week so that's 45 to 50 people they can impact, but it's 45 minutes uh, one day a week. It's a it, even that small amount is a drain on um, on patrol if we take those people out t to have them augment our our unit. Um, they're greatly willing to do it. Two of those officers are from Metro, and one is from North Zone. And their division commanders are, are letting their people participate, but that's just one class reach person because they have to go answer calls. We need officers in those units so we can get out there and affect hundreds of kids. Well, and you heard the city councilwoman today say you all make a difference. So we know it's important. It is very important. Keep our fingers crossed. Um, for a little bit more information about our staffing reductions, uh, the chief has a couple of comments. I know we've been talking about this monthly, but it, it's getting to the point. Um, we, you know, by the end of the, um, this month, we'll be under 1,200. I think we actually are right now. Our numbers of officers, um, there's a projected what if what happens, another 35 leave before the end of the year. 
And I'll give an example. Uh, downtown Footbeat has a sergeant and three officers. All three officers will retire by the end of this year. There'll be no one left in downtown Footbeat, and that mm. unit will not exist at the end of the year because we have no one to put in it. And it's the same way if someone in PAL or DARE leaves um, the department, we will have no one to be able to fill those positions either. And the very aspect that, that you know, we want community engagement is the very things that are getting hit the hardest as we try and respond to the citizens' need for 911 calls, which we feel and everyone should feel is the top priority of this organization is to be there for people in need when they call 911. So we struggle. Um, we will continue to struggle, but I, I, I have to tell you all that there's going to have to be decisions made at some point of some of these units and whether we keep them open or we close them and we reassign officers to get back to patrol. Our property crimes division is down 33% of, of officers. There's supposed to be 56 detectives. We're looking at, uh, uh, we're looking at 35 right now and they continue to decline as retirements come. Um, the, the staffing issue is a very serious and real issue in the police department. And it is going to affect, um, uh, hopefully not affect, the service we provide to citizens, but everything else is going to be affected. It's a, it's a challenging time. Uh, actually, it's a challenging time for employees everywhere, it not is. to mention uh, you know, getting people who are, are willing uh, to become police officers and go through the training and all that. Uh, we had some dialogue with MCC colleges. We did. Uh, has that uh, it t panned out to be fruitful at all? Um, I don't have any specifics on our applicants from MCC. Um, I'll ask about that and, and, and let you know. I think one of the discussions we had was because they do have a training facility, if there was any way to take some of their graduates and and not have to have as long a training period because they've already gotten some. You know, it's, it's a conversation. We have been in some discussions about that. Um, we Nothing has been determined at this time. The, the issue always becomes of the type of training what, what You know, they do a very broad-based training here when we do the Regional Police Academy. It's very much focused for our department. Right. And, it, it, you know, there's a lot of things that are specific now. We do the regional as, as, as much. But, you know, most of those regional agencies, they also choose to send to our academy and not go to... Um, Blue right. River is the other academy. So um, we're, we're talking, we're seeing what we can do, but um, we feel that the level here is a little bit different than the level there. Oh, absolutely. And that's all I have. That's your report? All right, thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? So I have a quick question. I was at a chamber meeting a couple weeks ago, and I know Kathy Nelson was there, and she was talking about... Uh, plans for the future, and I think in 2023 they're talking about bringing the NFL draft here possibly, and then in 2026 they're talking about the World Cup, which would bring in a ton of people, and I'm thinking we're going to have to like seriously beef up staff uh, probably starting now. Is this something that has even, I, like I said, I just heard about it in a chamber meeting um, that we can maybe put on a plan of action for the future and start planning, trying to get ahead of it instead of behind it like we are now? For the NFL draft, we've, we've had department members participate in that. Um, in, in other cities, they've gone and viewed. And so I, I think we'll be prepared for that um, as that comes. The World Cup, you know, is... As she said, what is 10 times what the NFL draft is? That would be a major challenge um, at our staffing levels that we have today. If, if what she projected of what I heard up there and what we have for resources would be a huge challenge. Because everything also grows um, 
with that. It's not just the event, it's the after hours, it is the private parties, it's all kinds of things that require off-duty employment. Then we have those officers working for us on overtime and other things. So, I mean, it very quickly our resources dwindle as we try and protect the city. So, um, yes, we would probably need some sort of staffing boost um, to handle that, in my opinion. Interesting. Is this something with the mayor that we could start maybe getting a plan of action on? Sure. I, I think it's definitely something we need to uh, figure out how to put it on the agenda, either open or closed, but it's something we need to start working on. All right. Thank you. Um, business items for approval. Who's handling that today? I have a few minutes to say good morning still. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> a few minutes. That's right. Um, all of uh, the Executive Services Bureau's items are located under tab B. Tab, say that again. B. B. The first item is budget a budget transfer for police grant fund 239. It's a standard transfer of $5,000 from capital outlay. And the amounts of 4,600 and 400 to contractual services. I said this is a standard transfer from our estimates at the beginning of the grant to what it is at this actual current time. So I request your approval on that. I move approval. <clears throat> it's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. The next item is an adjustment to a special revenue account. The uh, Police Foundation of Kansas City has donated $106,925 to be placed in a maintenance for our body worn cam uh, in, a, in a maintenance fund for the body worn cameras. I would request your approval and acceptance of their donation. I move approval. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Third item is a special revenue uh, account adjustment for $3,000. This adjustment is appropriated from the ETAC fund balance. The ETAC subscriptions were discussed at the last board meeting. Uh, this is just the adjustment after the final payment of that, that fund, and I would request your approval to uh, make that adjustment. I move approval. Second. All in favor by sign of aye. Aye. All opposed by no. I just have it. Fourth item uh, is going to be in regards to the expansion of our property and evidence warehouse. And I think uh, Deputy Chief Hicks is going to discuss that expansion first. The property and evidence warehouse is 98% capacity. Um, as you'll remember, um, we had to move that warehouse. Um, it's state of the art right now, um, but there's extra space available for us, and now is the time to prepare for the future. Um, we have a, a very robust disposal program now, so we're being able to handle the items much better uh, and, and destroy more items within uh, the evidence warehouse that are no longer needed. Um, but this expansion is, is definitely needed. It includes shelving, uh, lighting, and Wi-Fi devices for the bar scanners that they use. And the city has provided the money for this. This is not coming out of the police department's budget. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I move approval. <laughs> I second it. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. Ayes have it. All right. Item number five. Um, there are there are eight total radio tower sites in our city. Uh, the communication support unit has identified four of these sites that need the batteries to be replaced, the backup batteries. The backup batteries have a 12 to 15 year life cycle. All of these sites uh, that we have are over, over for their life cycle. We have worked with the city on this as these radio tires support not only KCPD, but they also support all the radio services within our city. We've identified four of these eight sites that we will have the batteries in place this year and we will identify and hopefully replace the other four next year. The city has actually requested us to purchase these batteries through our vendor, Ash Batteries, 
at a cost of $152,090. And then the city, once again, will appropriate those funds to us uh, to cover those costs. So with that, I'd, I'd request your approval on that. I move approval. It's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. Ayes have it. After the uh, fantastic presentation by the traffic unit, they, they brought up that their grant is concluding uh, in the next two days or a few days. Uh, the next item is the 2021-2022 traffic services grant that is from the Missouri Department of Transportation Safety and Traffic Division, uh, which awards the department five contracts beginning on October the 1st of this year, running through September the 30th of next year. We've been receiving these grant funds from them since 1982. These contracts are for $546,378.32 in federal funding and a local match of $65,000 or $65,056.32. Uh, the complete breakdown of that funding is in your board book, but I would recommend approval and acceptance of this funding by MoDOT. I had, a, I had a question uh, when I read over that. What percentage of that is used for education? Do, do you know that figure? As far as an educational piece like they talked about in the... Yes. Because I, when I looked at the breakdown of, you know, Jackson County is second in the state for alcohol-related crashes, and then they are second in the state for total crash ratings. Uh, I want to make sure that there is educational money and that it is being spent where it is most needed. We can so, get back to you on that. Yeah, exactly. we'll get back to on that. But I, if we put it in the grant, I will tell you it has to be spent on that category. Right. It can't be without some sort of approval by MoDOT. Oh, so once it's designated that, but as as you see, we have the rollover vehicle that goes to events like chair, like our community events. During that, a lot of that is spent on overtime for the officers, so they're not taken out of the field for that night. So I, as an example, I, I can't say that's where all the money goes, but I can, I can tell you there's, there's instances like that, that that education fund helps pay for that over time so they can be at the events. Okay. Yeah, I, I would be interested in, in seeing the percentage and seeing where it's spent to make sure that we got it uh, to the areas that are, that are most vulnerable. Absolutely. I can get to that. All right. And you had a question? No, I was I was going to say in the presentation that you referenced, they gave different statistics based on grant funding and other funding and what the budgets were, which makes it pretty clear that we're getting a lot of um, benefit from this contract and we should approve it. And I yeah, move and, approval. And, and they're doing a great job. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't think she heard you say you I move it. approval. All right, it's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no, ayes have it. Then the last business item I have is um, accepting funding for the MOIN Task Force, which is uh, the Missouri Western Interdiction and Narcotics Task Force. The Platte County Sheriff's Office is actually the awardee of that. Uh, we discussed that last week or, we, or last month when we transferred some funds within it. Uh, the new Grant has come in and the subawards to the Board of Police Commissioners a total of $249,251.74 for personnel and overtime for department members on that task force. It should be noted this is the 24th year that we've been accepting money for the, the MOWIN grant. I would recommend the acceptance of those funds. I move approval. We moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. Ayes have it. In the last two uh, non-business items I have, the chief brought up um, us providing services to, to, to our citizens and, and Deputy Chief T Hicks talked about uh, manpower. I just wanted to be noted that year to date, we've had 663,815 calls to the call center. Last year, that's compared to 652,186. 
So calls are call, up. Calls are up. Yeah. Um, and, and we perceive that to continue to happen. So if that gives you a reference number as well on calls um, coming in. But the one thing that I really wanted to talk about <clears throat> is uh, Officer Madrid Evans from Independence. Uh, I, I personally know his uncles, his grandparents, and they wanted to express uh, their gratitude to everyone. Uh, we had a peer support officer, Officer Williams, go help. They were they were very appreciative. So thank you from the from the family. And that's all I have, unless you have questions. All right, Office of the General Counsel. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, afternoon. My information is under tab G in your book. And the first item is just the monthly uh, summary. The second item is a, um, an appeal from a September 17th, 2021 um, denial of an armed license. This applicant um, was denied based on the terms of military discharge. And I believe you all have all the information provided in there. If there are not any questions, I present this for your consideration, the appeal. That's fine. Uh, in the appeal request, he suggests that he would be willing to have a probationary period. Uh, do we have any procedures in place for a probationary period? I don't believe that we have any specific probationary period for new applicants. I know sometimes um, companies are, are, will be on probation for violations. I would defer to Ms. Gallagher on whether that's something that can be done. All right, and if, if we asked for you to do that, could you work with the employer to determine if he is performing appropriately? I mean, I understand that the statute says what his um, denial or his discharge would not qualify him. But if we said we'd like for him to have a chance to work, could you then work with the um, employer to try and monitor that? Sure. So if we could do a six-month uh, follow-up and, and do a probationary um, uh, allowance to, to allow him to work, and, and if he performs and can bring back a letter and uh, a, a recommendation that he is performing up to par, um, I think that we have discussed doing maybe a six-month uh, probationary. Okay. Uh, I move that we have a six-month, that we approve it on the basis of a six-month probationary uh, issuing of the license. And I second that. All right. Been moved and second. All in favor by sign of aye. 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 All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Thank you, commissioners. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Um, Office of Community Complaints Update. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. The um, OCC has uh, no official report this morning. We'll be giving you our, our third quarterly report at next month's board meeting. All right. Thank you. Public comments. And I have um, four people on the list. Richard, I think it's Palmer. And you have two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you commissioners. Uh, my concern is um, for the safety of our officers after what happened to Blaze. Blaze was a friend of mine. I've known him since he was in high school. And I, our officers don't have the head protection that would stop a bullet. Our, mo 
Motorcycle officers, I don't believe, have that protection. We need some type of protection for these guys. We were lucky the last time here in Kansas City. We may not be lucky the next time. And we also need to figure out a way that these guys that do this don't get out of jail. We've got to work with the prosecutors and judicial systems to stop this stuff. Whether it's the attorney general or whatever, it needs to be stopped. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Ferguson. Implicit bias is something that I know we've had discussions about, at least with those officers and, and other entities that I've spoken with over the past couple of months. Um, most implicit biases are actually brought on by fear. And most of what I've heard in today's meeting is related to fear. Um, as I have watched in, and seen the presentation in regards to the DUI and the progress there, which I applaud, um, what I all heard was there was an increase of making us safer in the streets based on drunk drivers, based on the practices that they have. And it sounds like they're doing it effectively to also put officers back on the street by taking over in that time frame. So I was paying attention there. Um, but as I've seen the talk about the homicide statistics going down, I then immediately hear, we're out of officers and we don't have enough. And that's fear, that's fear sparking again. We as a community, as a society, as an America, base everything that we do off of fear. And it's done by the media. Um, as he's spoken of Officer Blaze, God rest his soul. Absolutely, absolutely God rest his soul. And may we have some protections for those that would be part of being profiled to be killed. But I don't think that that's what happened in Officer Blaze's situation. He was let, he was basically taken out of this world by a person that had been through the system but not held by the system. And so much in society, our media sparks fear because every time there is any crime that is committed by a person of color, and even though we don't have that much of a diverse crowd here, those of us black in here know that when it's us that does it, the media makes sure that our race is known. But the person that killed Officer Blaze was not of color, so therefore it was not known, and most people have no idea who did it. We as society have to learn how to critically think and go past what is presented before us. And I expect that from you as well. Additionally, we've got to stop the Kool-Aid that is basically making it to where your implicit bias is that Smith can do no wrong. Tolbert, I'm ashamed today to hear you give him credit for no, but thank you for having integrity and standing up and saying that that was not you. But if you guys are so much in tune to just giving him applause, you have to look at the full picture. Part of what the chamber said today, and I give them applause even though they spelled my name wrong as well as the name of my organization wrong, they listened to me. Part of the things that they presented before you here today came from me. I've presented those same things to you, but they've been disregarded when I present it to you. Now you want to know more because of who said it. We have to work on engaging with the community. The fact that I'm now having to worry about rushing to work is because you've disengaged from the community. You've moved public comments to the end on purpose. It's all psychological. It's not missed on me. But no matter even if I have enough points that I get fired from my job, Smith, I'll still be here. No matter what time public comments come into play, I'll be here. So make it more palatable that the community wants to be engaged with you instead of making such a grave disdain that you don't want the community involved. Additionally, your mission statement needs to be modified because it only says protect and serve, it doesn't say who. And too often you've heard me speak of who is being protected and the community is not being served by that. Cheryl, Engage with the community. You mentioned that you mentioned moving the public comments last time and again this time. We got literally 
hundreds of emails and letters from citizens all over this community that asked us to please emphasize our gun violence and other things that needed to be reported. And the mayor suggested that we move those things to the front and put the public comments at the back, which is exactly what the city does in theirs. So we're not doing it to in any way try to stop having public comment. Actually, several times, and I think you were here, people heard our reports and then said some of my questions were answered because they stayed and heard the meeting. So to suggest that we're doing it to punish you in some way is inaccurate. What we would like is for the public to come and hear our business, hear what we're doing. And we are doing the very best we know how to do, and this is how we think is a good way to proceed. Well, then I would also additionally encourage you as the board and I've spoken of this last time because with the South Council, uh, with the South meeting that they had with the South Neighborhood Association, one of the first things that they were saying before the meeting started is any members of the board here, you guys cannot sit on this seat if the only piece of people that you're listening to is this people in front of you. You are responsible to do just like the Chamber of Commerce did and engage with the community diversely. That is your responsibility in those chairs. I expect to see you start doing something about it. Thank you. J. Bear Kilwin. Do I press start? Or? Yeah, no, you have two minutes. Um, my name is Jug Bear Qatar. I've been a Kansas City resident for all my life, been born here, second generation African. Today I'm here to speak about an incident that happened last month, let's say 30, 40, 40 days ago, August 20th. I am a self claimed black owned business owner. I've been two years, two years a business owner in the state of Missouri, registered, three years being a business owner, five years as a mobile mechanic. On August 20th, I had a customer who tried to run me over with her vehicle. <laughs> Sorry, I said try. She did run me over with her vehicle, stated to call police, and when the police came, they took her side. I told the police, I'm on my property. This is a business transaction. This is a business meeting. I have it under documentation, and I have it under camera that she tried to run me over. Neither did the detective, Stephen A. Can't say his name, Carissa, uh, Officer Judith Cordona, Cordova, and Officer Jeremiah Habiner was there at the time, did not ask me no questions, did not ask me nothing, proceeded to arrest me on my property, escorted me almost without any hospital attention, without me requesting for it to go to the hospital to see of my injuries of being run over. I'm here today because I have a lawyer because I am charged with armed robbery. For what offense? For running for my life. A lady told the police officer I, I, run, I robbed her, and which is all false. I have it under documentation, camera, papers, and everything. I would like to show it to Detective Stephen A. Crescino. I called them twice after I got out of, I got out of jail three days after August 20th. I was in jail, incarcerated for three days. After being hit and being lied about. I'm here today because my lawyer told me there's nothing I can do because I've been trying to go to the police department twice to press charges on her. I have been talking to my lawyer. I have filed a civil lawsuit because she still owes me my money for the work I have done, the requirements that I've done, and the damage that I'm now, after this, I'm going to a chiropractor because I am hurt. I am being disabled from working. I'm not making no income from last month. I'm not making income from this month. So I'm here today to ask two things, help from the board and help from the chief of the police. I want to ask one question since I can't ask this to the board. 
I want to ask it to the chiefs of police. Justice. Does the only justice come from the victim and not the suspect? Because for some reason, detective pointed me as the suspect. And he would not hear my voice, no matter how many times I try to call him. How many, how many times I tell him I have video evidence or paper evidence that this lady signed an agreement for me to work on her car. She's going to pay me this amount, and it will be done. To this day, I go to court. On, I go to court Thursday, this Thursday. I don't know if we're going to win or we're going to lose. My lawyer is not telling me anything because the prosecutor hasn't gave us any evidence or say we have this or have this. So I have been 40 days in my house under uh, an app called Rebirth. I'm being monitored 24 hours. I have to go drop and pay money to drop. I have to pay for this probation. For what reason? For being a citizen, a black owned business owner, and just trying to do what I can for this city, for the people that I serve. I can have plenty statements saying that I am a qualified mechanic, I do honest business, I've been doing it for three to five years. I have never robbed nobody, have not stealed nobody, have not robbed nobody for no money. But for me to be claimed as a, I robbed somebody for their car, when you gave me permission to work on your car, written, verbally, and I have witnesses, and then you don't want to pay and try to kill me, and all I want to do is go to the police department, then to two. Let me say three, because North Kansas City do not service here. I went to headquarters. They denied me. They said, detective is on your case, will not speak with you. Went down to the East Department, where I was hold for a 24-hour hold. They said the same thing. You have to speak to detective about your case. My lawyer said, don't speak to the detective, because the detective won't help you. She told me to come here today, speak my case, see if the board can help me and the chief can please help me. I go to court in two days. I do not want to go to 10, I do not want to go to jail or prison for 10 to 30 years for something of a he say, she say. If there is any way you can help me. Thursday I go to court, I don't know what they're gonna say. I just like the detective to go over my evidence, not just his own evidence or the evidence that they just talked to the victim, but go over my evidence with my, with my legal team that I have right now. I have video evidence. She's stating why she run me over. She claims she's run me over, and I have videos her running me over twice. One, she came into the sidewalk. Second time, she came on my driveway. I told the police officers, the two, I can't say their name. I have it under recording. They did not care. They arrested me and took me downtown. Well, not downtown, to the east. I have been staying home so I don't get in trouble because I'm on probation. Anytime I come with an uh, interaction with an officer, I have to let my probation officer know. I do not want to get in trouble. I am an honest citizen. I have been working hard for me. I want to develop a life. I'm only 27 years old. I have a bright future. Please help me because 10 to 30 years in prison sounds like a life I don't want to live. And so sorry. have you uh, contacted the Office of Community Complaints at all yet? Um, no, I don't have that number. No one gave me that number so yet. The director is here today, and I'm going to ask him to speak with you uh, as soon as this because we are about at the end of this meeting. He's here. Merle, is that something you can do? All right, he'll speak with you and see what kind of help he can give you. Thank you. And I'd like to say thank you, Commissioner Cruz. What you said about vengeance, that is true. Just because I don't being here, not because my truth is not being heard, I have thought about it. Mm -hmm. But since the judge has told me anytime I come close to the residents, I'm filing my, pro my probation. Right. I have stayed home and my senses is going crazy. I told my probation officer, due to all of this, 40 days, my mind is not there. My family knows I'm not there. I don't talk to them. Because once you go to prison, nobody can help you. Right. Once you go to that judge, your lawyer is the only one who can talk for you because that judge don't want to hear your voice. 
Oh, if you, if you please, get oh. with uh, Merrill. Yes, I will. I, I think Carol, that's your. Carol, you your hand up, please? I mm -hmm. think that's your best, uh, best approach at, at this Thank point. You. Thank you. Uh, lastly on the list, Ron Hunt. I think he's left. All right. All right. Uh, Chief Smith, uh, anything that you want to cover? I, I uh, made most of my comments during the meeting when we were going through the board book. But I, I to uh, Commissioner Dean, you asked earlier about the trends of going up and down, and, and really the, we have no scientific data on anything about um, where it's going. But I think we heard presentations, you know, that non-fatal shootings down 20%, homicides almost down 25%, our in, uh, fatality accidents down again this year or after increase last year. And I, you know, it doesn't seem like any of that ever gets reported anywhere. And uh, I, I've said to many people that every month at this board meeting, we talk about these things every month and it's open to the public to hear about the trends of crime and, and what this department is doing to work on it. Um, so I hope the presentations today were robust and showed some of the commitment that the men and women in this department have to reducing the violence and, and keeping people safe. And the other aspect of that, when you think about 25%, I mean, we're talking human lives here. I, I know we get caught up in numbers but you know 25% of some families out there did not have to go through what some others did and I, I really think that that is a great thing for us in our city of course it should be much lower overall but when everyone else in America is trending on the opposite end it is nice that Kansas City Missouri is experiencing a, a, a much different trend here than we are in bigger cities and so I just want to compliment everyone on, on the work they're putting in to get that accomplished Thank you, Chief. Um, approval of uh, open session minutes, August 31st, uh, 2021. The uh, swearing in of our new commissioner, uh, Don Kramer. Approval. All right. Uh, it's been moved and second. All in favor by sign of by? Aye. Aye. All opposed by no. Ayes have it. Um, so, David, did that take care of both of them? Because it says August 31st. 2021 and all right uh david you have anything nothing at this time all right commissioner kramer no. all right uh commissioner wagner is out of town commissioner dean i think i've said enough <laughs> no uh, no all right and i think we've covered uh everything we have a list of our scheduled meetings uh and so we will have to have an adjournment to go out of open session into closed session is that correct or do we yes. adjourn first and then have a motion you just move to go into close i i move that we adjourn this meeting and go into closed session i second that and do we have roll call yes, yes. all right dean i talbert i Kramer, I. all right it's done we'll go into closed session thank you all